up their shoes and start to head over to the starting blocks. Twelve states are already sprinting to the finish line as they have already promulgated regulations that reduce emissions from cars. They have already concluded that the science is unequivocal. The risk is real and the solutions within our grasp. Under the circumstances, it would be helpful to the planet if our regulatory agencies would simply stop being obstacles to other actors. If EPA would grant California's request to act, other states could act as well. I hope that Mr. Johnson will be able to shed some light on the schedule for the approval process. I expect some of our witnesses have also taken note of the emergence of a legislative attempt to block EPA from acting. The discussion draft pending in the Energy and Commerce Committee, for example, would have the effect of overturning Massachusetts versus EPA. Specifically, that legislation would remove EPA's authority to set greenhouse gas standards for cars and preempt states' rights to by requiring EPA to deny California's request to move forward with its own greenhouse gas program. In its place, that bill proposes anemic fuel economy standards and opens the door to allow fuel made from dirty coal into our transportation fuel supply. The legislation fails to meet the test established by Speaker Pelosi earlier this year that any legislation we approve must both address America's energy dependency without increasing the threat of global warming and address the threat of global warming without increasing our energy dependency. So we have a moral obligation uh, to ensure that we reduce our dangerous dependency on imported oil from the Middle East by making our cars and our trucks much more efficient. And we must meet that challenge posed as well by global warming. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses, both from the Bush administration and its response to the Supreme Court decision and to Congress's pending plans to reject uh, that decision altogether, uh, and from the states, uh, which will be represented uh, here as well. Uh, that concludes the opening statement of the Chair. I now turn to recognize the uh, gentleman from Oregon, uh, Mr. Blumenauer, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I deeply appreciate your convening this hearing this morning. Uh, as you have noted, uh, given the um, draft that is circulated out of the Commerce Committee underscores some of the, the problems still at work here on Congress. And you and I, uh, along with Mr. Uh, Cleaver, uh, Ms. Herseth, uh, had an opportunity this last week, uh, starting in Greenland, but going across uh, Europe, dealing with uh, uh, leaders, true leaders, in coping with the problem of global warming, uh, underscoring the gap between uh, the foot dragging here through EPA for the last six years, aided and abetted by forces in Congress that are still in <coughs> denial. Um, it is critical that we have this conversation today. And I, I do deeply appreciate, I applaud your leadership, that of our Speaker, who has made it clear uh, that she, for one, uh, has a much different view. Uh, the gap between the science, between what is happening uh, with foreign countries where the United States torpedoed uh, an opportunity to, to have real progress just this week, uh, to what we are seeing. Uh, the lack of action by EPA for years is forcing at the local and state level initiatives. My state of Oregon is one that is joined with California in trying to deal meaningfully. We have 522 cities and hundreds of college campuses that have said, we are not waiting, we are going to move forward. Uh, but the, the mindset that we are seeing from the administration and some uh, forces in Congress, if we are not uh, equal to the challenge are going to set us further behind. And a world that looks to the United States for leadership will continue to be perplexed and disappointed. Uh, I am hopeful that we will be able to uh, bring into tighter focus <coughs> these issues as a result of the hearing that you have scheduled here today. Look forward to hearing from our witnesses, particularly the people 
who are fighting for the right for states to move forward to uh, step in where the federal government has been unable and refused. Thank you. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman. Sorry, Mr. Cleaver, for an opening statement. Oh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I'll have a very uh, short statement. I, too, would like to express appreciation to you and Speaker Pelosi for uh, the visionary move uh, that allowed us to uh, see firsthand uh, in uh, Greenland uh, what is transpiring uh, on this small ball uh, revolving around the, the sun we call Earth, and it is truly alarming. And as I have uh, said uh, many times uh, recently, uh, time is not on our side. Uh, on the front page of yesterday's Washington Post, which I'm sure uh, the uh, our witnesses have seen, there's a photograph uh, of a bay in uh, Greenland. Uh, we were in this spot uh, about uh, seven and a half days ago, and we had the opportunity to speak with Greenlanders who are not scientists, they're not Republicans or Democrats, they're not policy wonks, they're not uh, trying to get uh, any uh, pushback on uh, global warming. They are <coughs> residents. Just a few of the 53,000 people who live there, and they are very clear. Their lives have changed. Global warming is real. Places where they used to slay it, uh, now they fish. And when you look at this bay and see the blue and listen to the natives tell you that this is not supposed to be blue at this time of the year, it never has been, it is chilling. And then let me just conclude by saying <clears throat> it was terribly embarrassing to meet with legislators from other nations and to hear them say that they've spoken with uh, people in this government uh, who are still denying the science of global warming. It is my hope, it is at this point my prayer uh, that we will have a revolution in the way we think about this issue and begin to join uh, the uh, 21st century. Uh, I look forward to uh, raising some uh, questions with you uh, during that period. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. Uh, it's clear that we've had states really showing some vision across the country to move to defeat this scourge of global warming. And I think the state's message should be to the federal government, the, that old saying, lead, follow, or get out of the way. And frankly, this administration has not led, has not followed, and has not got out, got out of the way. And we are determined to have a federal government that will lead, much less not get out of the way. And the reason is, is that states historically have helped lead the country forward. You think about women's suffrage, it was Wyoming first in 1869 that moved forward, followed by Colorado. And these states, including California and my state and Oregon and six others, have helped lead this country to a new energy future. And we are determined in the next several weeks to have the federal government lead uh, to uh, show some leadership finally. I was in uh, Europe with uh, uh, talking to other members and other governments last week with an energy subcommittee and was asked to uh, respond to Prime Minister Tony Blair as he spoke to an interparliamentarian group in Berlin. And I had an exchange with the Prime Minister. Basically, uh, uh, I was presenting the, the case that the President's view that we can fight global warming with voluntarism is just doomed to failure. You know, you can run a bake sale based on voluntary activity. You cannot run a war on global warming. It's sort of like the President wants to write little frilly letters to the oil company and said, would you, would you fellas just stop polluting the planet and expecting them to respond? That's like expecting consumers to just volunteer to pay at the pump. The voluntary system is not going to work here. And I asked the Prime Minister what he thought the best argument was to try to get the White House and this administration to finally understand why we needed binding commitments, why we needed cap and trade system, why we needed a renewable portfolio standard. And I thought his answer was instructive. He said, it is clear we need new technologies 
And to get new technologies, we need to drive investment into those new technologies. And to drive investment in those new technologies, we need binding commitments to tell the investors that they should move to clean energy future. And I thought that was the right answer for the world and it's the right answer for America. And I look forward to the next few, a few weeks getting the federal government to finally show some leadership. Thank you. Great. Gentlemen, time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota, uh, Ms. Uh, Herseth Sandlin. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Markey. I want to thank you for having this hearing and I want to thank our witnesses. And Administrator Johnson was in South Dakota just a couple of years ago, shortly after we passed the Energy Policy Act of 2005, which uh, I supported uh, primarily because of the renewable fuel standard that we had for the first time uh, that many of us from Midwestern Great Plains states had advocated uh, for years and finally were able to get, although we didn't get it quite at the level that we would have liked, uh, I know that the administrator was taking steps at that time to uh, look at the regulations necessary as it related to the production process uh, in meeting the 7.5 billion gallon renewable fuel standard of which we will surpass uh, based on current projections by the end of this year, uh, which I appreciate the opportunity this morning to explore further with our uh, witnesses uh, and with members of the committee the President's 35 billion gallon uh, renewable I wish it were renewable fuel standard requirement. I think the language is alternative fuel standard. Uh, and so I look forward to exploring the issue there as I have done uh, with others at the White House with regard to renewable fuels versus alternative fuels and the importance of addressing um, a greenhouse gas reduction policy federally uh, that helps lead the way internationally as so many of our discussions on the recent congressional delegation trip to Europe uh, identified. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you again for the hearing, uh, and I yield back. Great. Gentlelady's time has expired. Uh, all time for opening statements by members has uh, expired. We'll now turn to our our panel. Um, Chairman, may I just inquire? I'm, I'm glad to. I, I, I don't see any of our Republican <coughs> colleagues here. Uh, was there any statement that was submitted to the record? that would help us clarify um, any of their positions or concerns nature and extent of the hearing today? Um, I would have to, if the gentleman would allow me to uh, inquire of the minority if there are any statements. But to be fair, um, today was a day that the Congress was supposed to be in session. The Congress has now decided that it will not meet today. And so I think uh, many of the Republicans have returned to their home districts as of last night in the morning, and I think that is something that note in fairness. Um, if there are any statements that the minority will include is on the record, but something that uh, has to be noted in fairness. Let me turn to uh, uh, now recognize uh, Stephen Johnson. Stephen Johnson was sworn in as the 11th Administrator of the uh, United States Environmental Protection Agency just over two years ago after 26 years at the EPA. Prior to becoming Administrator, he held several senior level positions including Acting Administrator, Deputy Administrator and held several other uh, senior level positions including Acting, uh, uh, administ uh, including uh, assistant administrator uh, uh, and positions. So we welcome you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Could you put on the microphone down there if you? <clears throat> Sorry, there we go. Okay, We're on. Now. Yeah, that's fine. Thank okay. You. Again, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today about climate change and energy security. As you know, in Massachusetts versus EPA, the Supreme Court made several findings regarding EPA's denial of a petition to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from new motor vehicles under the Clean Air Act. EPA is moving forward to meet the Supreme Court's decision in a thoughtful, deliberative manner, considering every appropriate option and every appropriate tool at our disposal. In that context, on May the 15th, President Bush directed EPA and the Departments of Energy, Transportation and Agriculture 
to coordinate our efforts in taking the first regulatory step to address greenhouse gas emissions from cars. The President called on us to base our work on his 2010 plan, which would reduce U.S. gasoline consumption by 20 percent over the next 10 years. This announcement both represents and responds to the Supreme Court's recent ruling and provides a path forward for improving our energy security by reducing U.S. dependence on oil. Additionally, in keeping with EPA's commitment to address the Court's ruling ex expeditiously and responsibly, we signed the formal notice that starts the public process for considering the California waiver petition. We recently held two widely attended public hearings, and the public comment period remains open until June the 15th. As we continue our aggressive yet practical strategy to cut our domestic carbon footprint, the President also understands that reducing greenhouse gas emissions is a global challenge. And on May 31st, the President offered a global strategy. Last week, the President called upon the world's 15 largest emitters to set a global goal on a long-term greenhouse gas reduction. The President proposed to convene a series of meetings with other countries, including rapidly growing economies like India and China, to establish a new framework for the post-2012 world. Under the framework, each country would establish midterm national targets and programs that reflect their own current and future energy needs. The President believes that by encouraging and sharing cutting-edge ed technologies, major emitters can meet realistic reduction goals. Both domestically and internationally, this, ad this administration is addressing the serious challenge of global climate change. As you all know, in 2002, President Bush committed to cut U.S. greenhouse gas intensity by 18 percent through the year 2012, a goal that we are on track to meet and even possibly exceed. According to the EPA data reported to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, U.S. greenhouse gas intensity declined by 1.9 percent in 2003, 2.4 percent in 2004, and 2004 percent in 2005. Put another way, from 2004 to 2005, the U.S. economy increased by 3.2 percent, while greenhouse gas emissions increased by only 0.8 percent. Under the President's leadership, we are seeing real results. According to the International Energy Agency, from 2000 to 2004, U.S. emissions of carbon dioxide from fuel consumption grew by 1.7 percent, while our economy expanded by nearly 10 percent. The U.S. had a lower percentage increase than Japan, Canada, the original 15 countries of the European Union, India, or China. And in fact, only two of the original EU 15 countries in the Kyoto Protocol are on schedule to meet their Kyoto targets. Over the last six years, the Bush administration has invested more than any other nation in the world, $37 billion, in a comprehensive climate change agenda. EPA climate programs include a wide array of domestic and international partnerships, which rely on voluntary measures to reduce greenhouse gas intensity, spur new investments, and remove barriers to the introduction of clean technologies. I would be happy to speak in greater detail about EPA's many climate partnership programs. Again, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. And before I take questions, I would ask that my full written statement be submitted for the record. Uh, without objection, it thank will you, be Chairman. included um, in the record. Our um, <clears throat> other very distinguished uh, witness on um, the first panel is Nicole Nason, uh, who began her duties as Administrator of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration just over a year ago after serving as the Assistant Secretary for Governmental Affairs in the Department of Transportation since July of 2003. Uh, we welcome you. Uh, have you already? Uh, please begin. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, since the Administrator spoke about 20 and 10, in the interest of time, I thought I would confine my remarks to CAFE this morning and, and that piece of the President's proposal. A key component of the 20 and 10 plan that the President has proposed is to significantly boost fuel economy for cars and for light trucks. The President's goal to raise fuel efficiency would save 8.5 billion gallons of gasoline annually in 2017. Towards that end, the Administration forwarded legislation 
to Congress to grant the Secretary of Transportation the authority to reform CAFE for passenger cars in February. The Bush administration has a proven record in this area. We have raised CAFE standards for light trucks for seven consecutive years, from 2005 to 2011. These higher standards are expected to save 14 billion gallons of fuel and result in a net reduction in carbon dioxide emissions of 107 million metric tons. As important, the attribute-based CAFE structure that we established promises fuel economy benefits without jeopardizing safety or causing job loss or sacrificing consumer choice. Basing our reforms on CAFE on the National Academy of Sciences, we structured the CAFE program to make it more effective and safer and fairer. And we accomplished this by using a structure that incentivizes manufacturers to add fuel saving technologies instead of downsizing vehicles. The reform has a number of benefits. First, we believe it will result in more fuel savings than under the old CAFE because now all automakers will have to make their vehicles more fuel efficient. Second, the reform has the benefit of preserving consumer choice. Under the old CAFE program, an automaker generally, generally manufactures a certain quantity of smaller vehicles to balance out the larger vehicles that they have been selling. Our attribute-based CAFE standard benefits new vehicle buyers by having all size vehicles, small, medium and large, become more fuel efficient. We also tackled what the NAS called the safety penalty. The National Academy of Sciences estimated that CAFE was partially responsible for between 1,300 and 2,600 lives lost in one year alone. They looked at 1993. Our restructuring of CAFE incentivizes automakers to add fuel saving technologies instead of downsizing the vehicles and we believe we are able to minimize the safety impact. Mr. Chairman, our effort to reform CAFE will guide the way in meeting our next challenge. As you know, as the Administrator just spoke, the President has directed the Departments of Transportation and EPA, Agriculture and Energy to take steps towards regulations that would cut gasoline consumption and thus reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The steps called for in the executive order will proceed in a manner consistent with sound science, analysis of benefits and costs, safety and economic growth. It is a complicated legal and technical matter. It will take us some time to resolve, but the President has directed us to complete this regulatory process by the end of 2008. We have receive most of the manufacturer's product plans for cars and we expect to receive their plans for light trucks shortly. Mr. Chairman, given the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Clean Air Act, there are now in effect two agencies with authority to regulate motor vehicle fuel economy and carbon dioxide tailpipe emissions. And as the President stated, our regulatory efforts are not a substitute for effective legislation. Accordingly, we continue to ask the Congress to enact the President's 20 and 10 proposal as the most responsible way to raise fuel economy standards, reduce our dependence on foreign oil, and cut greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you very much. I look forward to answering your questions. Um, uh, thank you very much. <coughs> and uh, now we will uh, turn to uh, questions from the Select uh, Committee. The Chair will recognize himself, Mr. Johnson. Uh, during the May 14th press conference on the President's executive order, you quoted Justice Scalia's dissenting view in the case of Massachusetts versus uh, EPA, uh, where you said that, uh, where it said that if you were to determine that there is endangerment associated with carbon dioxide emissions, only then would EPA be required to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from vehicles? Do you believe that emissions of carbon dioxide from motor vehicles endanger public health or welfare, Mr. Johnson? Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we, we believe that uh, greenhouse gas emissions and global climate change is a serious issue. And as we prepare and draft our proposed regulation for addressing greenhouse gas emissions from automobiles, uh, we will be addressing the issue of endangerment. 
it, uh, it's a process that we have been following since 1990. You've been following it since 1990, but you have yet to reach a conclusion as to whether or not CO2 does, in fact, endanger the public health let, or let welfare? Me, let me be clear. The process of, of addressing the issue of endangerment on air pollutants we include as part of our proposed <clears throat> regulation, and that's what I was referring to since 1990. The issue of global climate change, as you probably are well aware, uh, having read the uh, Supreme Court decision, uh, is an issue that goes back to the late 70s, in fact, uh, 1978. Uh, the Supreme Court does an excellent job of going through the, uh, the rather lengthy history uh, of, of the issue of uh, global climate change, and they, uh, they go back to 1978. Um, actually, it even goes back before that. I think <laughs> they just picked an arbitrary date. But the question is to you, Mr. Johnson, um, <clears throat> whether or not you agree with now the overwhelming consensus of science globally uh, that there is an endangerment to the public health and welfare uh, that is being caused by uh, emittance of CO2 into the atmosphere. That's squarely on your shoulders. And, um, and your answer to that question, of course, is the central question here today. Is it an endangerment to the public health and welfare of our country and, well, the, and the world um, that CO2 is, is being emitted into the atmosphere? Global climate change is a very serious issue, and the issue of endangerment under the Clean Air Act, particularly under Section uh, 202 and 211, uh, have to be taken into consideration as part of our uh, regulatory determination. Is it a danger, Mr. Johnson? Uh, is CO2 a danger to the American people, in your opinion? Mr. Chairman, uh, global climate change is a very serious issue. Is it, a very is it a danger to the American people, Mr. Johnson, that CO2 in massive quantities is being emitted into the atmosphere? We will be laying out our position on endangerment as part of our proposed regulation. It is really difficult to believe, Mr. Johnson, <clears throat> that you as the environmental minister for the United States, uh, as the chief protector of the environment for the United States, have yet to come to a conclusion as to whether or not CO2 is, in fact, a danger to our people and to the people of the world. You are the last major environmental minister uh, in the uh, Western world that has come to uh, a decision on this. And we should be the scientific leader, not the laggard. Uh, and to the extent to which you are still deliberating uh, allows for this danger to build as an even greater threat to uh, our people and to the entire world. Well, Mr. Chairman, the issue of endangerment is a legal term of art, as you know, that's embodied in the Clean Air Act. And as the agency has been practicing since 1990, that its position on endangerment on an air pollutant is included as part of its proposed rulemaking. My note to you again is we recognize that global warming and, and greenhouse gas emissions is a serious issue and that we are addressing it through drafting regulations for controlling it through uh, for new automobiles and the issue of endangerment will be part of our proposed regulation. I understand what you're saying, Mr. Johnson, but your testimony is just further evidence that the Bush administration is out of step with the science uh, and with the world uh, on this issue of whether or not CO2 endangers uh, our planet and the people in our country. And I think that uh, that uh, we are at a critical juncture at this point. It was not helpful that the White House uh, last week, in anticipation of the uh, G8 summit, said that 
the Bush administration's goals were aspirational for dealing with greenhouse gases. Uh, the White House, the Bush administration's goals are not aspirational. They are procrastinational. Uh, they want to delay uh, dealing with this issue. They have moved now from a policy of denial that there is a problem to delay in dealing with it. And the very fact that you are not answering this question of endangerment is just further evidence of that. Mr. Chairman, it would be irresponsible of me to make a final determination from a regulatory perspective under the Clean Air Act without having an opportunity to propose, go through notice and comment, and then make a final decision. Uh, I am abiding by what the law uh, directs me to do, and that is to go through a public notice and comment process. Oh, by the way, I think that is good government. And if you look at the schedule, in my 26-year history as a government employee, to write a major regulation generally, in my experience, takes 18 to 24 months. This well, is a very complex <coughs> regulation, and what the President has directed us to do is to write a regulation and have it final by the end of 2008. That right. is a very aggressive, yet we believe a practical strategy for addressing it. Well, uh, I think that you and I are going to disagree on that. In fact, uh, I just have to take note at this point that neither you nor your predecessors appeared for six years before the lead environmental committee in the House of Representatives. Uh, and that is in and of itself a statement of the relationship that existed between the Bush administration and the Republican Congress. I mean, never before has there been such a successful witness protection program ever built that the EPA administrator did not for six years have to appear before the lead environment committee in the House. And, and this um, a continued policy of delay here is something that uh, follows on that path. Let me ask just one other question, and that goes to uh, home state and its um, successful case, Massachusetts versus EPA, uh, and the decision which was rendered by the Supreme Court. Uh, <clears throat> as you know, uh, before the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, there is uh, now a language which actually removes the authority which the Supreme Court uh, confirmed that you had, that the EPA had, uh, to regulate uh, CO2 by actually prohibiting EPA from setting national vehicle tailpipe uh, standards. Uh, do you uh, support language which would remove from you the authority to be able to deal with uh, vehicle tailpipe standards? We have uh, taken, Mr. Chairman, we have taken no position on the legislation, but as uh, my colleague from NHTSA pointed out, uh, we prefer a uh, legislative fix and certainly prefer the President's 20 and 10 uh, legislative proposal uh, because it, it, it uh, provides, uh, it is less subject to litigation, uh, it also provides uh, certainty, and it also helps to uh, prevent uh, future delay. So you have no position on legislation removing authority from your agency? We have not taken any position on that legislation. Okay. Uh, and final question, it also forces you to deny the State of California's waiver request to implement its own vehicle greenhouse gas standards. Do you support these provisions that remove your agency's authorities? Again, we have taken no position on the legislation. Uh, the California petition, we are reviewing expeditiously <clears throat> and yet responsibly. The public comment period is still open. It closes on June the 15th. Uh, and that is uh, the status of where we are at on the California petition. And when are you going to rule on that? I have not made a determination of the date. Um, actually, it, it is quite shocking that the lead environmental agency in the United States is, does not have a view on the defense of its own authority uh, to protect uh, the environment as legislation moving through the Congress. It is just something I think at this time in our country very disturbing to the American people. Actual state of debate uh, within the Bush administration and between Congress. Let me turn now and recognize the gentleman from Oregon, uh, Mr. Blumenau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Johnson, 
Is it the intensity of greenhouse gases or the greenhouse gases that are providing the pollution that concern us about global warming? Uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions are what are concerning us about uh, global warming. Thank you. You cited uh, statistics uh, this last year. It was only eight tenths of a percent, I believe, that uh, emissions, uh, one point seven percent increase in transportation. Uh, at these rates, how how many centuries will it take? any of the other developed economies to catch up with the United States, to exceed us? What, uh, sir, what I do know is that uh, by analysis that the agency has done, approximately by the year 2015, the developing nations, such no, as India no, and China, I'm not talking about will, exceed, my specific will exceed question, greenhouse gas emissions. My specific from question was what you cited and referenced developed countries, not China, which, which uses a fraction, uh, three metric tons per person as opposed to our 19 metric tons. We also for have 1.3 billion absolutely, people. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. What, how many centuries would it take a developed, any of the developed economies to pass us at this rate? I don't know the answer to that. Would you calculate that just to give us a sense of perspective, how many centuries? don't need to know how many years, just how many centuries. The, is there any other developed country other than China that has taken this laissez-faire approach that you are defending for the Bush administration? Is there any other developed country that has an approach similar to what uh, you are advocating here today? First of all, I have to disagree with your not asking, uh, characterization. I'm not asking. I want to debate that. I, uh, <laughs> I want to know if there's any other country that has a similar laissez-faire approach. Again, I beg to disagree with your characterization. And in fact, as a nation, we are in fact the world's leader. We have spent 37 billion dollars on advancing science and technology. That's Mr. more than any Mr. other Johnson, nation in the world. We, that is, I'm asking specifically, and and. You can't have a straight face and look at on a per capita basis, on a percentage basis, what other countries are doing in terms of we are the largest economy in the world. We're the largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. We have put more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere than any other country in the world. Uh, the the comparison you're giving is uh, is beside the point. My question is: Is there any other developed country? that has a similar approach that you are advocating? What I, can, what I do know is that uh, the countries that are certainly part of the Kyoto Protocol, there's only two that are meeting their targets. The others are not. For example, My uh, question, so your answer is you don't know. I, you don't know. You can't well, name a single country of a developed country that is approaching this. Is what your answer is. You what can't I'm, give an what answer. I'm, what I'm citing is. Can you report is, back to us with an answer of any country that I is would, embracing a similar approach? I would be happy to uh, I would, report I back would, to you. I would very much appreciate okay. that. Um, you know, I, I had some other questions, but the one that just just overwhelms me at this point. You you've spent 27 years in the EPA. 26. 26. Do you have any concerns about? the morale, the credibility, the capability of that agency as a result of the leadership that you are providing now, the testimony you are providing now, the approach that is being advocated by this administration, does it, do you have any concern about its future credibility, the employee morale, the ability to, to be able to be up to the environmental tasks? Sir, I'm very proud of the outstanding employees and the work that the Environmental Protection Agency has done and continues to do. Uh, in fact, uh, for example, our Energy Star program that we in the Department of Energy uh, uh, administer last year in 2006, citizens of the United States saved almost $14 billion in energy costs while saving greenhouse gas equivalents to 25 million automobiles. That is the number of automobiles 
in the state of California and Illinois combined. That's a program. Our smart, SmartWise program dealing with, uh, with trucks and others, 550 companies have signed up, and we have significant savings in greenhouse gas emissions course, from that. That was not my question. Methane to market. Well, your question My question was, is, do you have any concern with the, with the testimony you're giving, with the foot dragging from EPA, with our being out of step with the rest of the world? Do you have any concern about what that does for the morale, the professionalism, and the credibility of EPA? Not a few projects <laughs> here or there that pale by comparison with what you can do down the street, go to the Norwegian embassy, go to <laughs> Denmark in terms of do you have any concerns about what impact this has on the functioning of EPA? Well, sir, I think we have a very aggressive and yet practical strategy for addressing climate change that's delivering real results. And I'd also like to point out that EPA, and in, in, in the independent survey, is, is, uh, was noted this year as being one of the top 10 best places to work in the federal government. And that's a fact I'm very proud of. And we're continuing along that way. May say more about the Bush administration than EPA, <laughs> but thank you very much. Great, gentlemen's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to get into an argument about whether the United States is uh, the headlight or the tail light uh, with regard to. Uh, dealing with this problem of, of climate change. I, I think people around the world already have pretty much answered that, that, that question. Uh, but during the Supreme Court case, the, the EPA uh, argued that if uh, it were granted the authority to regulate greenhouse gases under the CAA, it would be unwise, quote, unwise to do so at this time. The EPA, uh, EPA made the claims that doing so could conflict uh, with the current administration's efforts to address climate change, particularly uh, concerning international climate negotiations. So, uh, Mr. Johnson, in your opinion, why would the EPA consider coordination by the EPA uh, with the President's Climate Change Initiative to be potentially conflictive? Well, sir, one is that uh, we certainly, and I ex certainly accept the uh, Supreme Court's decision that uh, CO2 is a pollutant and that we are moving forward with uh, regulating uh, CO2 uh, from new automobiles under the Clean Air Act. Uh, this is, the Court's decision is very complex. Uh, we are moving forward in an expeditious but responsible way for addressing greenhouse gas emissions from automobiles. Uh, and certainly we're considering uh, the impact on other uh, sources, such as stationary sources. Uh, you know, I have so many questions that, I, that, that it's difficult to, to, to follow up because I, 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 I need to ask you so, so many questions. I'm, I'm frankly confused about this and, 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 as I mentioned earlier, a little embarrassed because we seem to be behind the rest of the world. Um, can you just explain? quickly give your opinion as to why the 27 nations of the EU um, are already moving and in many instances moving legislatively to deal with this this issue and we are not. I mean, how much time do you think we have um, to, 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 to begin to address this issue? Uh, and, uh, and if you, well, answer the, those first place. Well, first of all, I, uh, I believe the U.S. is a global leader in dealing with uh, global climate change. Do you think fact, anybody else in the world believes that? Well, and I, I believe, uh, uh, I certainly believe that at the, the uh, very pleased that uh, we reached an agreement uh, at the G8 uh, and that uh, it has been agreed that there will be a process for rapidly developing a new comprehensive post-2012 agreement. There's agreement to establish a long-term global goal to substantially reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And there was agreement that each nation should be the ones deciding on how is the best way to achieve that. And as I said, we have a very aggressive plan in the United States. We are beginning to write regulations to control greenhouse gas emissions from new automobiles. Okay, we have a number of partnership programs that are you. delivering real results, uh, and we are making progress. Thank you. Uh, I'm frustrated. I, 
I, and, and I'm frustrated only because, you know, I would, I'd like to have a candid exchange and um, and I'm, I'm not sure that, that this is happening. Uh, on, on March 13th of, of this year, uh, a draft bill uh, aimed at moving the United Kingdom to a low carbon economy was introduced. And without exception, the MPs that we met with last week all indicated that it was going to be approved. Uh, and in the measure, uh, 60, they set a 60 percent goal. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the measure would require mandatory 60 percent cut in the UK's uh, carbon emissions uh, by 2050 compared to the 1990 levels. And so when I see uh, nations moving ahead like that, I, I'm having difficulty trying to conclude that we are the world leader. And we won't even admit that there is global warming. Do you admit it? Uh, which, do you con concur that there is, in fact, global warming? Yes, as I said. In fact, the President has said ten, since 2001 that there is concern for greenhouse gas emissions and concern over global warming. That's why we've invested $37 billion as a nation well, to understand and to address it. How much longer is the understanding period? Well, as I said, sir, we're, we have been moving forward since 2001, and we, uh, with the President's uh, directive, are taking the first steps to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from uh, new automobiles. Thank you. If I, if I might just follow up with the gentleman on one question. You can't have it both ways, uh, Mr. Johnson. You're, you're touting the fact that you're starting to write regulations for tailpipe emissions, yet you have no view on whether or not the Congress should eliminate your authority to do so. Which is it? Well, I leave that decision up to Congress, uh, and certainly so the, it, as it, an administration, so we have not taken a position you, on that. You're saying it would be fine if the Congress removed from you no, that's the authority. That's not what I said. Yes, it is. You're no, it saying isn't. it's up to Congress. You don't have a view. Uh, You're going to sit there mute. Said we have not taken a position Brian. as an administration, sir. That's what I said. You're the you're the environmental minister for the United States. There's a proposal to take away your authority to regulate CO2 coming from tailpipe emissions. You're you're touting right now that you're starting to write regulations on it, and you're saying to us that you don't have a view on whether or not Congress should take away your authority. You are asking me to take a, a view of a specific piece of legislation which we have not taken a position on, and that's what I, that's what I keep repeating, that we have not taken a position on. Uh, there are many ways to address environmental, uh, environmental issues, uh, and that can be done through a variety of mechanisms, whether it is through NHTSA and CAFE, uh, through EPA and the Clean Air Act, or other pieces of legislation. Your, so, si your, your, science, your, your silence, Mr. Johnson, is deafening because it is a silence that the entire administration has had towards these issues for the entire six and a half years that it has been in office. Let me turn now and recognize the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Could you give us your response to the NASA report of May 30th, uh, 2007, about uh, the Earth's climate? Uh, I'm not personally familiar with that specific report. Well, this is a report. The headline is, Research Finds That Earth's Climate Is Approaching, Quote, Dangerous, Close Quote, Point. You have read that, I assume. Well, the reports that I have read are the uh, IPCC, the International Program on uh, Climate Change, and certainly as an administration, we have not only invested in those through money and our own scientists, but certainly we support uh, what the IPCC reports say. Well, that is impressive, but you are telling me the Director of the Environmental Ministry of the United States has not read the report just a few weeks ago indicating the United States is coming to tipping points. And did you not read the conclusion of the lead author, James Hansen, who said, quote, if global emissions of carbon dioxide continue to rise at the rate of the past decade, 
This research shows that there will be disastrous effects, including increasingly rapid sea level rise, increased frequency of droughts and floods, and increased stress on wildlife and plants due to rapidly shifting climate zones, close quote. Now, are you telling me that you were unfamiliar with that research? What I can tell you is the yeah, pretty, uh, second IPCC question. report, if you'd like me to answer the question, I'd be yeah, happy to. A yes or no would be, would be handy. Well, what I'm telling you is, is that uh, according to the IPCC, extreme weather, climate and sea level impacts due to climate change are very likely. I just so, want to make sure that I understand this, and so does the American public. Are you telling me that the, the lead minister of the Environmental uh, Agency of the United States, the director of the EPA, is unfamiliar with the most recent NASA research, which indicated we were approaching a tipping point, which could tip the climactic system of the world within 10 years? Are you, I just want to know, did you read that or not? Simply. I have not read that report. Thank you. I appreciate it. And your, con your policies are consistent <laughs> with not reading the science coming out of the federal government. That's now, a very unfair characterization, sir. Well, I read it. There are thousands. Well, that's good for you. Did you read the IPCC report? Yes, I have read it, actually, in quite in, in considerable detail. Let me ask you this. Uh, when, under the, under the President Bush's policies and your policies, when will, the, uh, when will we reach a tipping point which will tip us into major climactic shifts in the world? When will that occur? It is still an issue of scientific debate. And when, and according to your targets, when will the world reach doubling of CO2 from pre-industrial levels? Again, depending upon whose projections, uh, uh, I don't have a specific date, but uh, a number of scientists uh, have, have various opinions on when that might occur. And tell me this, when do you believe it should be allowed to occur? What is the target that you believe the world should have to uh, eliminate this catastrophic threat? What target should we have and what year? Well, that's precisely why the President uh, proposed at the G8 summit to bring people together to establish what that target should be and what steps then each nation should take to help achieve that target. We've been reading these reports now for over a decade. Are you telling me that the lead person for the Environmental Protection Agency cannot give us a target that the world should have to limit the amount of carbon dioxide to prevent these catastrophic effects. Is that what you're telling me? You can't well, give me a number or a date? No, I won't give you a number. I will, I'm saying is that there are many opinions, and we think that it's important for the nations, both developed and developing nations, to get together to, uh, to identify what that goal or that target should be and then take steps at the national level. And what is the United Nations, what is the United States' position on that? What should the target be? We have not made a position yet. We're paying a lot of tax money. I've told her, I, you told me we've spent, I don't know, $35 billion on this, and you can't come up with the number the United States should propound? Is that what you're telling me? Where'd that uh, money go? What I'm saying is, is that uh, we have not identified a specific number. We think that that's, there's a, a lot of science that uh, leads to a wide range of numbers, and that's why we think that it's important for us to discuss it in an international context. I can tell you that my constituents are grossly embarrassed by that response, that the leading nation in the world technologically who took a man to the moon cannot establish an international target of the head of the EPA who can't give us what the target should be is grossly unsatisfactory. And it's like saying that, you know, we're going to have a meeting next year to talk about whether or not we should try to get Osama bin Laden. We should have a clear target by now in the United States of America. And I cannot for the life of me understand why you can't give us what you think should be safe for Americans on that level. And I hope someday you can do that because we intend to create one in the United States Congress. My time has expired. Great gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota, Ms. Hersa Sandler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I indicated in my opening statement, the area I'd like to pursue with you uh, today is sort of these uh, perhaps interim regulatory steps the administration plans to take, but I would assume with the uh, uh, notion that it would inform the legislative process uh, that we are debating uh, here in Congress with regard to the dual objectives of energy independence and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, one piece of the administration's 2010, 20 and 10 plan is the alternative fuel standard. It would require 35 billion gallons of alternative renewable fuels available by 2017. 
and I strongly supported, as I mentioned in my opening statement, the 7.5 billion gallon standard in the 2005 Energy Policy Act. So I appreciate the additional initiative from the administration, and I know in visiting directly with the President, he feels strongly about this initiative, and he doesn't want to do anything to undercut his own initiative. So I would raise with you the question I raised uh, with him and other members of his staff uh, about the issue of the particular mix of energy sources that the administration envisions in satisfying this requirement. Uh, if you could comment on that, Administrator Johnson, any conversations you've had as the agencies work together, uh, perhaps uh, Secretary Johans has voiced uh, interest or concerns about this particular mix, and then you, uh, in your position in particular, uh, are you considering the relative greenhouse gas footprints of the fuels in that portfolio? Um, the answer is yes uh, to, your, to your last question. As part of our uh, developing our proposed regulation for addressing greenhouse gases from automobiles, there's really two ways of addressing. Well, before I get okay. to that, though, I want to talk precisely about the energy mix. And so what's yes. anticipated in the 35 billion gallon initiative, because I do have a question for you as it relates to Minnesota, mm -hmm. and when we get to these state initiatives and what they're doing and how your agency is responding. But when you say yes, you are considering the different footprints, may I uh, inquire a further elaboration as it relates to renewable energy sources such as cellulosic ethanol versus coal to liquid uh, in meeting that 35 billion gallon target? At, uh, with, regard to the, with regard to the legislation and the 35 billion gallons, uh, the legislation was, was presented and certainly announced in the State of the Union. It was focused on two things, one, energy security, and second, uh, addressing uh, environmental concerns, particularly global climate change. Uh, in our proposal, we were, I would perhaps refer to it as technology neutral. That is, that we identified a number of technologies ranging from corn ethanol to soybean biodiesel to cellulosic ethanol, as well as, as you, as you point out, coal to liquid. Uh, and so in that, uh, in our proposal, uh, we were being technology neutral, uh, but believe that, uh, that uh, with advances in technology, both for cellulosic uh, as well as even coal to liquid, uh, that we would see improvements both in the technology being more cost effective as well as also addressing environmental concerns, particularly in the area of coal to liquid. But our experience tells us if you look just at the renewable fuel standard of 7.5 billion gallons and how we have structured different tax incentives, that one fuel can overwhelm another. We have seen that with ethanol versus biodiesel which is why I propose separate standards for those fuels and carve-outs for cellulosic ethanol. Have there been any discussions uh, with your agency and others about separating out, understanding the, the, uh, what motivates the uh, technology neutral position, but how about uh, as these technologies are advancing that we don't have you know, the possibility of coal to liquid, which doesn't have uh, the kind of footprint uh, in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, that ethanol production does, cellulosic ethanol in particular, about separating out uh, the renewable, the, the standards for which we are reaching an aggregate of 35 billion? We, we uh, in, in some of our scenarios that we ran to, to determine this ambitious goal of 35 billion gallons, we looked at a variety of combinations and we believe that certainly cellulosic ethanol plays a, a very significant role uh, in helping us, helping the nation achieve uh, 35 billion gallons. Do you believe that we can achieve 35 billion gallons with renewable fuel sources alone, or do we need alternative and need coal to liquid? Well, those are those are part of the uh, part of the discussions that we need to, need to have. We think uh, we think there's opportunity for all, certainly from an environmental perspective, and as we move forward on the regulation of fuel for addressing greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act, certainly the carbon footprint will be a, uh, an issue that we have to address. The greenhouse gas emission is something we have to address for all of the, uh, for all the alternative fuels. Mr. Chairman, may I inquire one additional, if I may ask one additional follow-up question on the issue of the state initiatives. I know that um, some of the folks spent on, on California's initiative 
Uh, we may be pursuing that more with the next panel. Could you provide me and the rest of the committee an update on your work with the state of Minnesota mm -hmm. as it relates to evaluating uh, the greenhouse gas emissions from automobiles with higher blends of ethanol currently only in 10 percent ethanol blend is approved, but the Minnesota State Legislature has um, acted in a way that would in increase that blend to 20 percent ethanol. And if you could uh, address that both as it relates to uh, what you're doing with new automobiles and your regulatory authority, but also existing automobiles in the fleet, uh, those that are maybe only a decade old versus those which are pre-1995. Would please to. Would you like me to respond now? Mr. Chairman, I, yeah, we're, we're actively working with, uh, with, the, with the state to, uh, and in fact, uh, this summer we're expecting uh, data to help, uh, help us uh, better understand the 20 percent. I mean, the, the questions <coughs> that we need to address to make sure that the 20 percent blend doesn't have a negative impact on emissions uh, or, or the equipment. And we're working with all the stakeholders, uh, including the state, as well as the automobile industry and fuel manufacturers. Uh, and others, Department of Energy and, and others to, uh, to make sure. So we're very, very much uh, interested in and reviewing and considering uh, the proposal. The lady's time Thank has you. expired. And uh, we'll go uh, for a second round here. There are some other questions, I think, that has to uh, unearth before we reach the uh, second panel. Let me uh, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, if you are going to regulate fuels by setting an alternative fuel standard, following up on Sandlin, Hurst, uh, Sandlin's question, if you are going to regulate fuels by setting an alternative fuel standard under Section 211 of the Clean Air Act, you have to uh, uh, have made an endangerment finding. How can you? reconcile an endangerment finding with the promotion of coal to liquids, which has dramatically higher greenhouse gas emissions than renewable fuels, and have the administration be making that proposal to the Congress? Well, as part of, uh, sir, as part of, Mr. Chairman, as part of our analysis of our uh, uh, developing our proposed regulation, we'll, we will be evaluating the coal to liquid as well as other alternative fuels uh, to uh, make sure that uh, they will meet uh, what uh, we end up uh, proposing for regulating greenhouse gases from new automobiles. So that is a very important question and important consideration. Well, I think it is a conflict for the administration. First, you are saying you have not had time to make uh, an endangerment finding, but simultaneously you are proposing a coal to liquids program for the United States. And it just seems to me that you have got a responsibility to issue your endangerment uh, finding and do so soon, given the fact that Congress is now uh, considering your coal to liquids proposal. And I, and I think that uh, there is an urgency to it. You have no time really left. And, uh, and if Congress moves forward, uh, it will be because you didn't resolve this conflict. And it is squarely on your shoulders uh, to decide whether or not this coal to liquids is something that. Uh, is uh, going to endanger us with additional CO2 uh, emissions. Uh, Mr. Johnson, you have pointed out that assuming you do move forward with a rulemaking as a result of the Supreme Court decision, you will be required to find that carbon dioxide emissions from vehicles uh, endanger public health or welfare in order to do so. Assuming that you do make that finding, is it, it's, is it safe uh, to say that EPA would also have concluded that carbon dioxide emissions from power plants and other stationary sources pose such a danger and that emissions, therefore, also must be regulated under the Clean Air Act? Sir, the Supreme Court's decision, which, as you know, as we have been discussing, focuses on uh, motor vehicles and with regard to uh, impact on other sources under the Clean Air Act. Uh, we're we're in the process of evaluating that now. Just to put a fine point on this, if it's a danger, if CO2 is a danger coming from tailpipes, would it not also be a danger coming from utilities or coming from industrial stationary sources? From a legal standpoint and under the uh, under the 
terms under the Clean Air Act? That's one of the important questions that we're reviewing right now. A rose is a rose. CO2 is CO2, Mr. Johnson. It would really be helpful to us if you could just give us some confidence that if you find that CO2 is a problem coming out of tailpipes, that you also think it is a problem coming out of utilities, other industrial stationary sources, not satisfactory answer. Let me turn to uh, you, Ms. Nason. Um, the Bush administration, um, uh, President Bush in his State of the Union address uh, recommended that we increase the fuel economy standards by 4 percent per year over the next 10 years. Let me just show you a chart, uh, Ms. Nason, because I think this can be helpful to you so you can understand why this proposal is so important and, uh, and why uh, this Massachusetts versus EPA decision and the California statute are so important. Uh, in 1977, we reached 46 percent dependence upon imported oil. It ramped up very quickly from, uh, <clears throat> from a very small percentage over a seven-year period to 46.5 percent dependency on imported oil. Uh, but the Congress passed a law, a law saying that the fuel economy standards for the American automotive fleet had to be doubled. Uh, over a 10-year period. And so while it was at 13 and a half miles per gallon in 1975, it mandated that by 1986 it be doubled to 27 miles per gallon. And you can see what happened after that law went into effect. We dropped down by 1985 and 86 to only 27 percent dependence upon imported oil. Uh, and our consumption of oil dropped. And as a result, the carbon footprint coming from our automotive sector dropped dramatically. However, then, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, until today, a 20-year period, no significant increases in fuel economy standards uh, has been promulgated. Uh, and in fact, we have now slipped backwards from the standard we reached in 1986. Uh, back from 27 back to about 25 uh, miles per gallon. And so as a result, we are now 60 percent dependent upon imported oil. In other words, we increased from 27 percent dependence on imported oil to 60 percent dependence on imported oil in just 20 years. Now, we have 170,000 young men and women over in Iraq. 1.6 million Americans have now served over there in Iraq. 1.6 million Americans have gone over there. Uh, and, uh, and while the administration has used some justification for being over there, uh, we now realize it wasn't a nuclear weapons program. They knew for sure before the war started that there was no nuclear weapons program uh, in Iraq and that there was no Al Qaeda connection. This place as a source of oil, the Middle East is a place uh, that we, uh, in fact, receive our oil from becomes increasingly important. Um, if we increased to 35 miles per gallon, which is 4 percent per year, that actually backs out all of the oil which we import from the Persian Gulf. And so the President's proposal becomes very important. Uh, <clears throat> in the past, um, uh, while rhetorically saying the right things, we have found that on many of these environmental re environmentally related issues, um, the uh, actions have not followed. So my first question to you, Ms. Nason, is does the President want you to mandate that this 35 miles per gallon uh, standard be reached by uh, 2017, 18 or 19? A mandate, Ms. Nason. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, could I just talk about the chart for one sure. second? Um, as you know, most of oil use that we bring in is gasoline. It's about 45 percent, another roughly 15 for diesel. So transportation accounts for our greatest use of oil. One of the things that we saw happen in the fleet in the 80s, again, as you know, is that 
the mix changed dramatically from cars to light trucks. And uh, there was a far greater percentage, it's half now, light trucks versus cars compared to where it was in the 70s and into the early 80s. And so that did change. While we have seen greater fuel economy in cars, the increase in the fleet of light trucks, uh, you know, SUVs as cars for people, did have an impact on overall fuel economy, as I know you know. And the President's proposal, the eight and a half billion gallons that he talked about in the State of the Union, and the really only way to get there is to do roughly a 4% increase in CAFE year over year to 2017, which is the 2010 proposal, does not contain 4% in writing. As we've discussed, it is a goal. It is a target. It is something that we take, obviously, very seriously I and mean, we would work very hard to meet. But it is not something that we have put in writing in the statute, because the President has also said that he'd like to see us do a full, comprehensive rulemaking weigh all of the factors that we need to weigh and that our target should be 4 percent, but uh, we didn't put it in writing in the 20 and 10 proposal. Yes, that's the problem. And the problem be is that um, the administration has yet to say anything about the proposal which is before the Congress right now um, that in draft form, which calls for an increase of only 1.7 percent per year through the year 2022. So um, would this administration oppose, would you oppose any legislation uh, which uh, will undermine your goal of 4 percent? In other words, will this administration oppose language which sets a goal not of 4 percent but of only 1.7 percent? I think the best answer I can give you at the moment, Mr. Chairman, is that, uh, as we have said, we really would like to work with the Congress to get the authority to reform the program. I think the place we do have agreement, I have looked at your legislation and others, uh, is on reforming the program. I think where we have disagreement is on stringency levels. I, I hope See, here is the problem with the President um, and with your agency, Ms. Nason. Um, what, what he wants to be able to say in the State of the Union is that this is a goal which is achievable for our country. It is critical for the national security of our country. But he is not willing to mandate it. Uh, and, in fact, if Congress wants to cut his goal in half, uh, which is what it is now saying, this administration won't say anything about it, has no recommendation on it. And, and, and so we wind up with the administration setting a goal but it is not mandated. Having Congress propose something, some key Congress people propose that they cut the goal in half, have the administration say nothing about it. Uh, and then we are supposed to believe that this administration cares about, one, this huge importation of oil from OPEC and this rising concern about global warming. Uh, and it doesn't square, Ms. Nason. The actions of the President do not square up with the promise uh, that he has made to the American people uh, on these issues. Let me ask one other question. Uh, Mr. Johnson uh, has been given authority under EPA versus Massachusetts to regulate CO2. Uh, the legislation which is now pending before the Energy Committee would strip Mr. Johnson of his ability uh, to regulate and strip his ability to give to the states their ability to regulate. Um, do you support that legislation? Do you believe that the uh, EPA is not a proper place to have jurisdiction over uh, this issue? Well, I think we are working very well together as the President directed for 20 and 10. If you are asking what I do support, I support 20 and 10. That is the President's no, proposal. I am asking now about this very critical jurisdictional issue which is at the heart of this hearing and the heart of the legislative debate which we are having uh, right now in uh, this city. Do you support um, this legislation which would strip the authority from EPA and, the, and repose draft, it exclusively in your own agency? The draft committee report. That's correct. I think as Mr. Johnson has, as the administrator has made clear, sir, we don't have 
an official administration position on the, the draft legislation or many of the other bills that we see going through the House and Senate, but we do look forward to working with you to try to get uh, legislation through this Congress. Is, your, is, the, is the goal of your agency, the mandate of your agency, to look after the health of our country? No, sir. It is not, is it? No. No. Uh, Mr. Johnson's agency has the responsibility to look after the health of our country. If CO2 is found to be a pollutant and it is something which is endangering the health or welfare of our country, he has a responsibility to do something about it. Uh, you, on the other hand, have a responsibility to increase the fuel economy of our vehicles while ensuring that safety is maintained. That's a different responsibility. Do you have a problem with Mr. Johnson having the authority to be able to protect the health of our country? I have by... no problem with the administrator. <laughs> well, I'm talking about him having the authority to uh, protect the health and welfare of our country. Do you have a problem with that, Ms. Nason? With health and welfare, no, sir. No. So, so. <laughs> no, I have no problem. With well, there is there are there is language in the draft bill which we are now going to be considering next week in Congress, which would strip Mr. Johnson of his ability to uh, deal with that issue. So that's a problem, and it's something that uh, obviously concerns this panel uh, greatly. And I would hope that it would concern the president, although I'm not um, really assured that he has drawn his attention to it. Let me turn and recognize the gentleman from Oregon if he has any questions. Chairman, I, I do okay. has a plane to <laughs> Okay, let me recognize let me recognize the gentleman from uh, from uh, Washington state. Uh, thank you. The world is rapidly reaching a consensus that we have to stop CO2 from going beyond a doubling of CO2 and from pre-industrial levels and eventually even your administration will reach that conclusion, I'm confident. But your administration continues to insist that we can cut our emissions of CO2 in half or more, which we have to do to reach that target, by voluntary mechanisms. That somehow, if the President just asks American industrial leaders to cut their CO2, sends them a nice letter on nice stationery, that they'll just voluntarily cut their CO2. But when your administration wants to test our kids and no child left behind, not a voluntary program, don't get to make that decision. We require our kids to perform. Why does your administration require fifth graders to perform but expects voluntary decisions by CEOs of the largest corporations in the world to sort of volunteer to solve this problem? Let me first, uh, first comment that, again, uh, we have a wide array of partnership programs that are delivering results. In addition, as we've been talking about, <coughs> we're in the process of writing regulations, mandatory regulations to control greenhouse gases from new automobiles. So it is what our overall approach is, includes an array of partnership programs, and it includes now this mandatory program of addressing greenhouse gas emissions from new automobiles. But your proposal will specifically reject what the rest of the industrialized world has embraced, at least in European Union, a cap and trade system to have a mandatory enforceable cap on CO2. You have rejected a renewable portfolio standard, which will give Americans the guarantee they will have renewable clean energy. You have rejected meaningful enforceable standards for green building requirements. You have rejected virtually every significant thing other than baby steps at big, at, at most. Isn't that correct? That's not correct. Well, are you going to embrace the cap and trade system? This let's, is news uh, to me. Let the let the let's, uh, let's start, blow here. Yeah, let's uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's start with the list. Uh, we have not rejected a renewable fuel portfolio standard. In fact, it wasn't that many weeks ago that I signed the final final regulation imposing the 7.5 billion gallon requirement on the United States. So, are you suggesting? And, and to we are, as part of our regulation of deal, dealing with automobile greenhouse gas emissions, there are only two ways. There's no special catalytic converter that you can put on an automobile or a light truck to address greenhouse gas emissions. Are you embracing? There's two ways. There's one to address the fuel and to address the 
engine efficiency. Sir, I, I don't have a lot of time, and there is a plane. Um, are you suggesting to Congress that we adopt a renewable portfolio standard to give Americans the assurance we'll have a certain degree of electricity from clean renewable energy sources? I, I believe that we should be working together to achieve uh, our energy security goals and environmental Will goals. Will the President sign a bill that has a renewable portfolio standard in it? Well, I look forward to working with you to uh, address that issue. Will the President sign a bill that has a cap and trade system in it? No. That's unfortunate. And I think you're premature, and I hope you are. Because the world is looking for America to reclaim leadership, the country that established democracy, the country that put a man on the moon, to have the White House stand in the schoolhouse door of the most effective thing we can do to preserve the environment for our kids. And I hope you haven't checked with the President. I hope you're not authorized to say that. Because if we're going to have a meaningful dialogue with the White House, they've got to keep that door open because it is the single most effective thing that we can do for our grandkids. And I hope that you go back and check with the White House again and said, you know, maybe I spoke a little too soon in answering that question. Because I heard the President say he wants to turn over a new leaf, sort of, in Europe the other day. And I hope that happens for my grandkids and yours. So I just hope you have that conversation. I got one other question. Maybe I don't. <laughs> I think uh, you've made enough points. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I think he made his point. The gentleman from uh, Oregon, Mr. Blumenau. Uh, thank you for allowing me to, to shift. I will be very brief. I just have two additional follow-ups. Um, um, I'm, I'm listening to uh, Mr. Johnson, your rhetoric about uh, the uh, commitment and the progress that is being made. I believe I read a GAO report that you have missed 34 consecutive deadlines for upgrading appliance efficiency standards? This oh, administration done. has missed 34 consecutive deadlines for appliance efficiency? Well, we've been working uh, effectively with the uh, Department of Energy to uh, help uh, establish efficiency standards, and there are some technical issues. Has uh, this administration up. missed 34 consecutive deadlines for increasing appliance efficiency standards? I would have to get back to you for the record, sir. In the ballpark? Is that in the GAO in the ballpark? Uh, I'm, I'm familiar with the GAO report uh, on the specifics. Some of the uh, smart people behind you? No. <laughs> if well, it's, if <laughs> DOE it's has the responsibility for prom promulgating is what uh, my note says, sir. Yeah. <laughs> so you're going to punt. Uh, I just, uh, I would just respectfully suggest that actions do speak louder than words, and the failure of this administration to meet 34 consecutive deadlines for increasing appliance efficiency speaks volumes about the commitment of things that would actually make a difference, a sense of urgency. Um, and it's another reason why I am, um, uh, it's hard to take what you're saying at face value when little, tiny steps that are already established in law, this administration can't figure out how to do. I could understand one out of ten, maybe two out of ten, you know, batting only 400, you know, but 0 for 34 strikes me that you and the administration aren't serious. Which leads me to my other question in advance of hearing from Attorney General uh, Brown and others in the, who, uh, we have, as I understand, you have not yet announced a timeline for making a final decision on the waiver request, is that true? That's correct. Can you give us some hint of what the timeline is going to be? You've been sitting on this now, doing whatever you're doing for uh, 10 weeks since the decision. It's been bubbling since 2005. Do people have to sue again to get a, a deadline? Well, I, as I mentioned, we're expeditiously and responsibly following the statutory process, which requires a hearing. The I state of California that. I don't asked want you to have for to re repeat what you already said. For, That's why I asked, do you have a deadline well, that I, these people can count on? Is it going to be have, in three weeks, three months? What I have said to the state of California and others 
is that I want to wait until the close of the comment period, which is next Friday, have an opportunity to assess the nature of the comments, and then we'll make a specific decision as to the timing of when we will make a decision. Thank you. I thank the, uh, the gentleman very much, and I would note that I am the author of the 1987 Appliance Efficiency Law that the administration has missed all 34 deadlines in six years in applying in, in imposing uh, higher standards for efficiency for all of those uh, devices which we use in our country. And of course, because they missed all 34 deadlines over six and a half years, dozens of new coal fired plants have, have to be built to generate the electricity for the less efficient appliances which we use in our country, contributing, endangering uh, our atmosphere with those additional emissions for refrigerators, or stoves, or whatever that could have been much more efficient. Let me turn and recognize the gentleman from Missouri, uh, Mr. Cleaver. Uh, and, and those coal plants um, are producing about 520,000 tons of uh, nitrogen oxide. Uh, which is, is uh, polluting the atmosphere equal to about 500,000 automobiles. But I want to return to the lawsuit, <clears throat> uh, the Supreme Court case, I'm sorry. Um, you argued, uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, that the regulation of, of uh, CO2s would require the regulation of fuel economy standards. Uh, which the, uh, you stated is the ju jurisdiction of Ms. Nason. Um, but the Supreme Court then responded uh, by saying that uh, it recognized that the multi -agents, agency efforts were needed uh, to address certain issues. And then the court stated, and I quote, the fact that the DOT's mandate to promote energy efficiency by setting mild standards may overlap with the EPA's environmental responsibilities, in no way licenses EPA to shirk its duty to protect the public health and welfare, unquote. Uh, so I would like to ask both of you, actually, uh, recognizing the uh, Supreme Court decision, uh, is there now ongoing work between the two agencies uh, since the court decision, and what direction is it going if, in fact, there has been uh, a response to the the Supreme Court's uh, directive? Uh, the uh, one word answer is yes. We are working together post the Supreme Court uh, decision. I'm sorry? I said yes, we are working together uh, post the Supreme Court decision, and it is uh, following what the President's uh, executive order directing us to do, and that is to work together to develop a regulation that will regulate greenhouse gas emissions from new automobiles. Did that? I mean, were you working together prior to the to the Supreme Court's decision we, on, on this? Uh, well, we work very closely together because uh, one of EPA's uh, roles and responsibilities as part of uh, fuel economy uh, is to calculate fuel economy. That's the the window sticker in the windows. And as I'm sure you're probably well aware, I issued a rule last December which actually significantly improves uh, that window sticker for the 2008 model year. And we work together in the CAFE program. We do tests. The automobile industry does tests, mission tests. We share that uh, information with our colleagues uh, at NHTSA and Department of Transportation to enable them to well, monitor my, and calculate CAFE. So we have a long-standing relationship together. Thank you. My, my, uh, the reason I raise the question is the, the, the fact that your attorneys uh, suggested that um, that it was the DOT's responsibility, I mean, the, uh, arguing before the Supreme Court, which would also suggest that there was not prior uh, work together. Well, we have been working together for, for years uh, well, why would on the, the issue of, of uh, air pollutants and uh, engine efficiency as well as fuels. Well, why would, the, why would, the, so. the, why would your attorneys argue that it was the, the DOT's responsibility? 
my uh, my recollection uh, is that uh, I mean I have it right here. Okay, well, it was my my recollection because of the cafe, because Department of Transportation is responsible for the cafe standard, not EPA. Miss Miss Nason, is that is that uh, yes, your understanding? Congressman, I think there was concern about. Um, not having overlapping regulations, and as uh, you just said, the, the Supreme Court's word there was overlap. Yes, there may be overlap in the obligations now, but we are certain that the agencies can work together to Seamlessly. resolve Seamlessly. That. <laughs> and we are. <laughs> we I, are. We can't enforce CAFE <laughs> without the help of the EPA even before this, so that's what we're working together to do. That was the President's directive in May 14th. Um, well, I'm glad this is being televised because I think the people around the nation are weeping with joy because two federal <laughs> agencies are working together, holding hands, walking under the great moonlight. Uh, let me, my final question uh, relates to uh, deforestation. Uh, station. Um, scientists have, con well, of course, if we don't agree that the scientists, <laughs> um, <laughs> some dumb scientists have c c concluded that um, that the loss of natural forest uh, around the world contributes more uh, to global emissions each year than the transport sector. And so um, if, if that is, do, do you agree with that, Mr. Johnson? Before well, I we don't, uh, EPA does not have responsibility for uh, our, the forests of our nation or I understand global forests, that. but uh, certainly uh, uh, from an administration perspective, uh, we are concerned about uh, global deforestation and uh, believe that across the, across the globe steps need to be taken to avoid uh, deforestation. That's the most cost-effective way to reduce emissions, do, don't you agree? It is a, it is a, it is a way of, uh, it's one of the tools in the toolbox, yes. I'm, okay, I'm trying, I don't know of anything that's more cost-effective than just saying that we're not going to uh, yeah. cut down a tree. Uh, and so I'm, I'm just wondering what, what international uh, effort is underway or is there any dialogue going on on this subject uh, in terms of the, the deforestation of the, uh, uh, around the globe? Uh, I would, uh, if, if I could, sir, uh, get back to the record for the record for you. Uh, as I said, it's not uh, EPA's responsibility, but uh, certainly be happy to uh, uh, have uh, our colleagues that are. I know that our State Department and others are uh, intimately involved in, in helping to address this issue, and we'll, we'll have a response back to you. Thank you. Uh, it, it is my hope that, uh, I mean, there's been a, a, a lot said over the last uh, week or so from the administration, and, and it is my hope that at, uh, at, at some point there will be more done than said. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just real quickly, a uh, follow-up observation from the comments and questions from Mr. Inslee and Mr. Blumenauer, and then just a follow-up question for you, Administrator Johnson, uh, along the lines that I was pursuing earlier. When we were in uh, Brussels a couple of weeks ago uh, with Speaker Pelosi, uh, I raised the issue with President Barroso about an interim target that the European Union had set for renewable fuel usage for 2005 and the fact that they missed that target. And I asked uh, President Barroso and others in the room what the reasons were for missing that target. And the explanation was the fact that it was voluntary and no one took it seriously. And given our own experience with a mandatory cap and trade for sulfur dioxide emissions, given our own experience that President Bush seems to have acknowledged with a mandatory 7.5 billion gallon renewable fuel standard that has now led to his initiative of a 35 billion alternative fuel standard, I do hope, as Mr. Inslee stated, that that indicates some willingness of President Bush to work with us as we move forward to recognize the importance of uh, mandatory uh, policies that reach the objectives and the importance of making them mandatory uh, to meet the, the objectives, whether it's greenhouse gas emissions, reductions, uh, and our, again, our own experience here in the United States with a cap and trade system, as well as with these fuels, alternative fuel mandates. Uh, my follow-up question uh, for you on the uh, 
Minnesota studies that are going mm -hmm. on. I know you had mentioned that we'd be getting data sometime this summer, but does the EPA have any sort of timeline or deadline for then uh, assessing that data and making a decision about whether or not to approve something other than uh, a 10 percent blend of ethanol with gasoline? Uh, we don't because it, part of the reason we don't know when the data are going to come in or what the nature and extent of the data are. But as I said, we're, we're, uh, we're working very cooperatively with the, with the State and others to, uh, to help address the issue. Um, but that some of the data will be available this summer. Yes. But again, I don't know what will be or won't be and will it be sufficient to be able to make a determination. Again, we're, we're operating in an open and transparent way to address the issues of, again, emissions as well as uh, the engine and, and whether, in fact, uh, it can accommodate uh, a higher, higher blend of ethanol. Um, certainly, uh, uh, you know, our, our, our hope is, is that the, uh, the engineering and all the, the answers will, will uh, uh, point us in the direction of the ability to do higher blends. We certainly support E85, for example, uh, because it has, uh, it's good for the economy, it's good, it's good uh, from an energy security standpoint, and it also has a better environmental profile. So. Well, I agree with you on all that, but uh, given that we're still struggling to get E85 pumps available across the country, we've got to deal with the existing domestic fleet as Detroit manufactures more flex fuel vehicles, and many of us believe that the data will support uh, that the existing domestic fleet can take something uh, higher than an E10 blend, and so I would appreciate it if you could keep uh, this committee as well as uh, uh, the committees of jurisdiction I know are similarly interested. Uh, in this issue apprised once the data comes in this summer so that we can also evaluate uh, what the initial studies and analysis looks like. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll be pleased to do so. Thank you. Thank you. And let me, Ms. Nason, let me just do one final line of question. Um, the four of us who are here, uh, along with Speaker Pelosi, uh, visited first Greenland. 10 days ago, uh, observe this incredible phenomenon which is occurring, uh, rapidly intensifying pace of melt uh, movement uh, of the ice cap and glaciers and icebergs that, uh, uh, if it ever happened, would lead to a 20-foot rise in the sea levels of the world. A frightening experience. I recommend to you, Mr. Johnson, that you go to it and that you see what's happening in Greenland. To you as well, Ms. Nason, so that you can understand fully the danger, not just to those that live in Greenland, but to those who live in the United States, those who live in Florida, those who live in the coastlines of our country, if this phenomenon ever did occur. And if we're going to stop it, we have to start now. If we're going to protect people from something that happened 50 and 100 years from now, we have to start now. And by the way, 70 percent of all people who will be alive uh, in uh, 70 percent of the people alive today will be alive in the year 2050. Not doing it, but some theoretical group of people, 70 percent of all people living today. We have a responsibility to protect them. Now, in Europe, what we found was that uh, they're going. They're mandating in Europe a 43.4 miles per gallon standard by the year 2012. Ms. Nason, they're already at 35 miles per gallon. You're telling us today that you can't commit to a 35 mile per gallon standard 10 years from now. That you can't commit that it will be mandatory. And yet the Europeans are going to meet a 43.4 mile per gallon standard by 2012, only five years from now. And not only BMW and Daimler Chrysler and Volkswagen, but Ford and General Motors have said they will meet the European standard. And Ford and General Motors are the leading automotive com companies in terms of sales in Europe. Why, Ms. Nason, can't we meet that standard? Why can't we at least say we will do 10 years from now what the EU is doing today? 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was in Germany last November and then in Japan last week, and I'm going to Brussels next week to meet with essentially the NHTSA counterpart woman over there. Uh, they had had voluntary standards in place, which my understanding was the manufacturers had all said they couldn't possibly meet. And this was some of the difficulties that they were having. In Germany, they were saying they couldn't meet the European standards. And we had some very, I think, interesting discussions with the Japanese government about uh, their cafe and how they would like to, to see changes. Um, I, I haven't seen Ford or GM say that they could meet 43 miles a gallon. That would be oh, very no, they, interesting. They have, I, I talked to the American Chamber of Commerce in Europe, and they said they're meeting the standard. Matter of fact, every American company that does business uh, in Europe has signed off on and said they will meet the goals that the EU is setting for a cap and trade system for emissions across all industries as well. That all the American companies doing business over there, which are all of our biggest companies, will meet that European standard. They have different, as you know, they certainly have a different fuel mix, fleet mix in Europe. Um, I think half the fleet in Europe is diesels, and most of those diesels wouldn't meet the clean diesel requirements in the United States. So there are alternative ways that they could meet a standard that they might not be able to meet in the United States. That, you know, there's far greater penetration of diesels in the marketplace in Europe, and I think that they are looking to bring clean diesels to the United States. I've seen. Chrysler, for example, is looking to make them their Jeep line diesels, um, barring perhaps on what Daimler had been doing in Europe with the Mercedes diesel. So I, I do think that technology is going to make the difference in how they can meet the standards in the U.S. I'm not, I'm not, we're not looking for us to take on a task that's impossible. Let me just ask you one final question. The Ford Escape. SUV, hybrid, gets 36 miles per gallon. Is the Ford Escape SUV hybrid less safe than the Ford Escape SUV? No, sir. No. It's the same safety, but with 40 percent higher mileage. So we're not really asking for you, Ms. Nason, to take on this responsibility. Um, to ask our automotive industry to do something that is impossible. It is something that they are already doing. We are asking you to set this goal for 2017 or 2018 that can meet that national challenge. Um, and, uh, and it is critical that you do it. We didn't hear the right answers today with regard to it being mandated or it being 35 miles per gallon. What we have heard here today is that initiatives to reduce carbon emissions, such as tailpipe standards, or even fuel economy standards are being stalled, while initiatives that increase carbon emissions, such as coal to liquids, are being encouraged. I suggest that President Bush is in danger of cementing his place in history as an environmental Emperor Nero, a man who fiddled as civilization burned down around him. And it is very important that this administration under threat to this planet. Thank both of you for your testimony here today. Uh, we will uh, be working in close conjunction with you for the next year and a half. Speaker Pelosi has made it quite clear that she wants to see a dramatic reduction in imported oil and it also wants a mandatory cap and trade system. Uh, the United States Congress and to be placed upon the desk of the President. That is going to require the two of you sitting here to be the central players in accomplishing these goals. So we hope that uh, and we know that this will be the first of many visits that you have back before the select. Thank you. And now we will move to our second panel. Uh, our second panel um, is uh, here in order to uh, ensure uh, that we uh, get to uh, the heart of the uh, uh, matter in uh, Massachusetts versus uh, EPA and the California uh, statute. Here for, uh,
cannot find. Our second panel um, couldn't be more uh, distinguished. Um, we'll uh, first uh, uh, recognize a former California Governor and now Attorney General of California, Jerry Brown, who has a long history of public service that cannot be overstated. Uh, he uh, is someone who uh, from the beginning of his career has been identified uh, with the uh, environmental uh, movement and the protection of the environment in our country. Uh, we welcome you, uh, Governor Brown. Uh, whenever you are ready, please begin. Okay. Thank you. It is kind of hard to know where to begin after having listened to that uh, exercise in obfuscation. Uh, I don't blame the deputies of the Bush administration since obviously they are under discipline and under orders uh, to stall and stonewall, which uh, I guess they have done about as good a job as you could expect. Uh, I did examine the administrator's testimony with some care, and I guess the central fallacy is very well stated on page 4, where he says, and he mentioned similar sentiments during his testimony, quote, this is a complicated legal and technical matter that will take time to fully resolve. Well, not in California, because we have already resolved it. We have resolved the technical issues and the legal issues. We have a comprehensive plan ready to go to control uh, emissions of uh, greenhouse gases from automobiles. We are in the process of, of working up and then promulgating uh, a comprehensive control strategy to cover power plants, and industrial emitters and all other sources of greenhouse gases that California has uh, the authority to regulate. Uh, it is clear uh, from the evidence that uh, the Bush administration has been opposing efforts. I, I thought it was interesting in your comments about appliance efficiency standards. Uh, when I was Governor, uh, my Energy Commission adopted appliance energy efficiency standards and building efficiency standards, by the way, uh, in 19. I think it was 1983 by the time they became final. And then the Reagan administration adopted a no standard standard to preempt it. So w w this is an old story. Uh, in fact, it is a very old story about the waiver because back in the good old days when we had a movie actor uh, representing California by the name of George Murphy, and he defended the California waiver against uh, the gentleman from Dearborn, Michigan, and uh, the honorable congressman. Uh, argued very strenuously, uh, but his uh, measure to uh, gut the California waiver was defeated. And the legislative uh, history uh, will clearly uh, demonstrate and portray that uh, Senator Murphy and there was another congressman by the name of Smith all felt California had a pioneering role to play, and that was the purpose of the waiver to enable California to lead the nation set standards, and that, uh, uh, that view was then uh, reaffirmed and extended in subsequent years when um, uh, the Clean Air Act was amended to allow other states like Massachusetts and Oregon uh, to copy California once the standard was enacted. So we actually have two standards. We have a national standard, which often is no standard, and we have the California standard and the uh, 50 states or the 49 other states can pick. Um, I think we have to recognize here that this is not so easy. Uh, I noticed the administrator comment that some of the European countries and signatories to the Kyoto Protocol weren't doing so well. Well, uh, nobody's doing too well, including uh, the people uh, uh, of this earth and this world that we're living in, because CO2 is rising. Uh, according to the National uh, Science, um, uh, National Academy of Science, rather, uh, CO2 rose about almost three times faster 
in the last four years than had been previously uh, thought. So things are getting worse. And the fact that the administrator tells you that the emissions only grew by 0.8 percent and the intensity has gone down doesn't mean too much when you realize that vehicle miles driven are going up, coal plants are on the, uh, are on the uh, uh, horizon here in great numbers, and then you have China building a coal plant every week. Uh, we're facing a very difficult um, problem. And if you listen and you really step back and look at this testimony, and you want to know uh, your call here on this meeting was, what, you know, what's our view of, the, of uh, the, the Bush's response? What's California doing? Well, I think the President's response is laid out here. And when I use the word obfuscation, I, I lay it out very carefully. There's a lot of little stuff here. There's a this and a that, and maybe this $37 billion, I'm not quite sure what it goes to. It may be helpful. It may not be. But the key term has to be measurement of carbon, a measurable target that will be a cap that will express a comprehensive cap for the country as part of a larger cap for the world. But we have to start with our own country. We need that cap. And then by sector, there will be a subsidiary cap. Now, when it comes to uh, transportation, that's 28 percent of the greenhouse gas in America come from transportation. And automobiles are about 20 percent of that if you take into account the upstream uh, emissions that are required just to build the cars and to, to get to produce the fuel. So you have to look at a life cycle measurement. California has already embarked upon a low carbon fuel standard. And that standard um, that is being uh, um, spearheaded by Governor Schwarzenegger and the California Air Resources Board sets a 10 percent uh, reduction uh, within a fixed period of time. So I think the, the real question here and the real challenge is to get an agreement on what are the total amount of greenhouse gases that are being produced, what is our yearly goal to reduce them, what is each sector's contribution. And f unless you have a measurable uh, goal, unless you have uh, auditing and in a way that you can enforce your goal, it is not only rhetoric, it is obfuscation, and it's really dissembling. And uh, it's hard to know, uh, you know, if anything at all was gained at the G8 when uh, President Bush said, okay, now we're going to do something. We're committed to coming out with some non-binding goals. He is getting, in effect, uh, caught up in this whole global warming discussion. But he's coming uh, kicking and screaming, and it's going to take the Congress, and it's going to take the states, and it's going to take a lot of grassroots organization to move the ball forward. Uh, we are fighting a political battle here. It is financed uh, in great measure by automobile companies. Uh, they have sued uh, the little state of Vermont. They overwhelm them with the highest paid lawyers in America. Uh, and why was Vermont sued? Because they dared adopt the California standards. The automobile companies aren't waiting for the EPA to grant a waiver. They're already trying to destroy the standards through litigation. Uh, we are facing a lawsuit in Fresno, California, on the same topic. Rhode Island is being sued because they have dared to adopt the standards. Every state that adopts the California standards, and there are now 12 of them, will be sued, will have to face millions of dollars of legal onslaught paid for by General Motors and the other members of the Automobile Alliance. But not content with their uh, lawsuits and their over lawyering this issue, they have now gone to the Commerce Committee and they're pushing a uh, legislative short circuiting. Uh, of the legal process. Uh, that's really incredible uh, for uh, such a proud industry. Now, I want to go just to go to the heart of the matter here because we heard uh, the woman from NHTSA talk about it. And they invoke the talisman of consumer choice. Consumers uh, 20 years ago uh, didn't know that they needed SUVs and minivans. Only 10 percent of the cars sold. Now, as she acknowledged, it's 50 percent. That's just sovereign consumer choice. Not exactly. This is massive propaganda and manipulation in the form of advertising to promote a certain profile of automobile that suits a certain uh, profit profile. And I understand that's good old American 
uh, economy, it's the market system, and, and that's fine from that point of view. But unless this Congress can curb uh, that choice, just like we do in other areas, we don't have unlimited choice about everything we do. We have social and moral restraints. When we see the danger of climate change and the disruption that's going to happen to our lives, uh, the rapid uh, snow, uh, snow melt in California, which will destroy our levees, impede our agriculture, the increase in, in uh, ozone that will affect the children's lungs and respiratory disease in the elderly, the erosion of our beaches. This is real stuff, not to mention uh, you know, the elimination of, of low-lying countries like uh, a, a good part of Bangladesh and other islands in the Pacific. This is serious stuff here. And uh, in order for that, uh, for us to do anything, we're going to have to have restraints. We're going to have to have rules. That's what, uh, that's what Congress is all about. And I think we have to uh, recognize that it is going to take some changes. Technology is, is very important, but it's not the only thing. Uh, technology has a number of choices. We have to different vehicles, different engines, but also different fuels. And whatever we can do to that, we have to do it. There's three things that, uh, that are obvious. One, we have to reduce uh, carbon in our fuels. We have to reduce fossil fuel consumption by efficiency, by technological uh, invention. Number two, we need renewable energies. And number three, we have to be able to sequester uh, and, ca and cap, or not cap, but uh, prevent uh, carbon from uh, getting into the atmosphere from the burning of coal. It may not be here today, but it's worth spending billions of dollars because we have to get there. You have to do all three, and you have to do all three to the maximum degree as fast as you can. And what you saw today uh, was, I suppose, you know, two good, two good administrators. I don't want to say bureaucrat. Uh, but they are good people, and they're doing what they're told to do, or I suppose they'll be fired, just like the U.S. attorneys. I, I, I do think that there's some responsibility on the part of the administrator to follow the law, not what George Bush tells him, not what Cheney may say, not a little message from a White House staffer. I do think there is a legal requirement to follow the law. If they follow the law, California will get a waiver. Uh, the EPA will... Uh, promulgate regulations to control g greenhouse gases uh, across a broad front. Uh, so just in conclusion, I'd say this. This is not easy stuff. It's going to be tough. Um, if he gives us a waiver, and when I read this testimony, it looks like he is in total stall mode under orders of the president. If that's true, we will sue him. Uh, Governor Schwarzenegger has already announced that. I'm his lawyer. We'll be there the first day we can. But, of course, they can stall. Uh, even if he gives the waiver, the automobile companies are suing us. So it is going to take a couple of years to get this done. And ultimately, uh, it's up to you. We need Congress uh, to settle this problem. But in the meantime, we have to do everything we can to get our waiver in California, to get other states to adopt it, to get the fuels, to get the cars, and to do the job across the whole sector. We're committed, and I'm committed to every legal, political, and consumer activist initiative uh, to get this job done. And I just want the automobile companies to know that there will, there is a, there, there's a price to be paid uh, for their sabotage uh, of, of the California waiver. Uh, California is the biggest automobile market. And I would just hope that um, the president of General Motors and other companies who refuse to meet with me uh, are listening, because I take this very, very seriously. And I'm not going to. Uh, lay down on this. I'm going to fight with every political uh, and legal strategy uh, that I can envision uh, during the next several years where I still have enough energy to go at them. But uh, they have an adversary, and we have been at this thing when I was governor. We had the same cast of characters fighting us when we wanted to reduce emissions on oxides of nitrogen uh, and other technology and the catalytic converter. It's the same cast. It's the same problems. It's the same money. And we in California have uh, even more resources now, and we're going to go at it. It's no longer just Democrats. We have Republican governors in Connecticut, in California. I think we can have other Republican governors around with Democrats. So it isn't a party thing. The Democrats are split in Congress. The Republicans hopefully will make up for the uh, defecting Democrats. And uh, together, uh, we're going to take this country back from uh, Cheney's uh, 
oil mentality and Bush's uh, whatever, Texas uh, mm -hmm. short, short sighted mismanagement of so many things that we're now suffering from. Thank you. Thank you, Governor, very much. And uh, I think that uh, when it comes to your political energy, if there ever was such a thing as a renewable energy source, you are it. I don't think anyone's worried about you running out of energy battle on this issue. Now we turn to our other Attorney General, the Attorney General from the State of Massachusetts, my own Attorney General. Uh, she has had an incredibly distinguished career uh, and the District Attorney of Middlesex County, the largest county in New England, one of the largest counties in the United States. Uh, she lives in uh, Medford, Massachusetts, which is where my congressional office is. Um, but most significantly, um, the case Massachusetts uh, versus EPA, uh, the most important environmental decision ever rendered by the Supreme Court uh, of the United States, uh, was won by uh, Massachusetts. And Attorney General uh, Coakley here today uh, is uh, obviously a central player in this whole debate globally over whether or not we're going to deal with this issue. Uh, it's our honor to have you uh, with us today, Attorney General Coakley. Uh, and look forward to your testimony. Turn on the microphone, please. Is that better? Yes. Thank you, Chairman Markey and Congressman Blumenauer. And uh, General Brown, Massachusetts will be right with you in that battle, as many of the states will, um, around this particular issue. Uh, I appreciate the invitation for General Brown and I to uh, talk to you today. I have submitted written testimony. I'm going to be brief this morning, uh, but would ask that the committee accept the written testimony as part of this hearing. Uh, and I cannot resist a very brief. Without objection, that will be included in the record. Thank you. I cannot resist a brief fish story uh, around the global warming issue. I recall uh, I had the great good fortune in the summer of 1974 to work for Congressman Silvio Conti, who is from western Massachusetts where I grew up, and one of his big issues was cleaning up the Connecticut River, getting rid of the PCBs, uh, bringing salmon back to the Connecticut River, and he was successful in doing that. That was a good result, salmon in the Connecticut River. Uh, I read, Congressman Markey, that after your trip to Cannon, Mar uh, Cannon Mountain to look at some of the effects in, in New England of global warming, uh, that the local fishermen off New Hampshire and Maine indicated that for the first time they were seeing bluefish. They had never seen them north of Cape Cod. A very tangible result, a true fish story, but not a good one, and a harbinger of what we are facing. Uh, as the Supreme Court recognized this past April, states are and will be directly harmed by climate change particular in Massachusetts, we are losing 200 miles of coastline to rising seas. States across the country are concerned about threats to water supply, the increase in se severe weather events that are costing all of us. General, ba General Brown mentioned some of the effects in California. This Commonwealth, Massachusetts, recognizes global warming needs immediate attention. In fact, it needs it yesterday. To this end, we are engaged in regional greenhouse gas initiative, a market-based cap and trade program for power plant emissions. We are committed to investing in renewable energy and are leading with proposals for green public buildings and expansion of public transportation. Meanwhile, we have been waiting and eager for the Federal Government to take a leadership role in our necessary fight against global warming. One of the committee members earlier indicated that the Federal Government should uh, lead, follow, or get out of the way. It is a huge issue on this particular issue, as I might note it is on others, whether it is consumer protection, submortgage lending. Uh, the Federal Government has, uh, frankly, been uh, a huge disappointment in this issue. We have been long waiting for the Environmental Protection Agency to adopt motor vehicle emission standards that would allow states to address the leading cause of global warming. Given the decision in Massachusetts versus EPA and Congressman Markey's opening remarks, I won't belabor the history of the case, but it is important to note that the United States has been for a long time, since 1992, uh, part of the Rio Treaty, and it commits the United States and other developed countries to, be, to reduce emissions and presumably to take leadership in that. Uh, Congressman Markey outlined the history uh, where, frankly, not much happened. Uh, particularly recently in environmental groups filing the rulemaking petition in 1999. Uh, that was the basis of the suit that Massachusetts was lead counsel for. Uh, and I think it is ironic uh, that in this day and age, Massachusetts and other states 
have had to file a lawsuit to demonstrate to the Environmental Protection Agency that its job actually includes protecting the environment. Simply put, the EPA cannot plausibly say that the statutory trigger for commencing regulation that emissions are endangering public health and welfare has not been met. They refuse to do that today. It still f flies in the face of common sense and all the evidence that they see before them. We are heartened, I will say, that the White House and EPA appear to acknowledge this in their characterizations of the impact of the Court's ruling and in their promises that regulations controlling greenhouse gas emissions will be forthcoming. However, we are disheartened, as I believe uh, we were today, that the EPA has stressed the need for lengthy periods of time, both to digest the Supreme Court decision, and I would note that the Supreme Court decision is not that complicated. It is pretty straightforward in what it decides in terms of standing, the authority of the EPA, uh, and their need to articulate some reason why they can't issue these regulations. Uh, they have indicated that they need to embark on a period of exhausted deliberation with other agencies about what to do next. We are also discouraged by the EPA's reluctance to commit to firm proposals or any timelines for action. If they are serious about attacking the problem of global climate change, then there are two specific things that they should pursue immediately. They should begin immediately a formal process to conclude that endangerment threshold has been crossed. Starting that process is simple. It requires no further deliberation on their part. They need merely to publish a notice in the Federal Register and to, uh, that they propose to determine that these emissions cause, contribute to air pollution, which may be reasonably be anticipated to endanger public health or welfare. By beginning the process now, the EPA does not forfeit any right to deliberate over more difficult regulatory design issues involved in actually setting the applicable emission standards. However, a continued unwillingness even to start that process says that their promises about being concerned about global warming are illusory only. Secondly, once that public comment process concludes next week, the EPA should grant California's request for a Section 209 waiver for State Motor Vehicle Regulation as expediently as possible. I want to emphasize, as General Brown did, how important the EPA's approval of the waiver is for the dozen states, including the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, that have adopted those California regulations. While California has notified the EPA it will sue if they don't rule on the waiver by October, there is simply no reason for the EPA to wait that long. They should decide it more quickly. They should give a timeline on when they are going to decide. And I frankly think that uh, General Brown and I speak for our coll colleagues when we say we would like nothing better than to see any further litigation by State Attorneys General on this, issue, on this issue obviated. We do have other things to do as Attorneys General than to bring to the attention of the Federal Government that it is not doing its job. Uh, and so that is an important issue, I know, for California and for all of us who say uh, lead, follow, or get out of the way because uh, they can't have it every way. You know, the Supreme Court ruling has induced many industry groups to call for a more comprehensive and a market-based approach to replace a sector-by-sector -sector command and control regulation under the Clean Air Act. We welcome in Massachusetts the engagement of the affected industries in the legislative debates, and we hope that they will work uh, to help produce an efficacious result. And we emphasize that while Congress can improve upon the regulatory approaches that the Clean Air Act provides, we are very firm in believing that the current law allows the EPA to immediately go a long way to addressing the problem now. As Congress considers additional legislative approaches, we urge it to reject the language that Congressman Butcher, Chairman of Energy and Air Quality Subcommittee of the Energy and Commerce Committee, unveiled last Friday and held a hearing on yesterday. I addressed that more uh, at length in my written testimony. Uh, it would be taking a step backward to proceed with that legislation. And while individual states continue to work or lessen environmental impact, Congress could take a major step in the right direction by passing legislation to significantly increase our fuel economy standards without hampering states' emission efforts or marginalizing the EPA's authority, uh, helping both our environment and consumers' wallets. We specifically urge Congress to respect and support the role of states in developing solutions. We need to find creative ways to structure such a program that allows for states to continue to play a leadership role without placing excessive burdens on local industries. And we suggest, for example, if a national cap-and-trade emission trading program were enacted, 
emission credits could be distributed on a state-by-state -state basis, allowing each state to set aside additional reduction should they so choose. I want to thank you again for allowing us this opportunity both to submit written testimony uh, and orally today. Uh, we appreciate in Massachusetts the critical work that you are undertaking, not just for our nation, but for our planet. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you both for your testimony. Attorney General uh, Coakley, let me ask you this question. You referred to the uh, hearing which this Select Committee on Global Warming had earlier this week up at Cannon Mountain in yes. New Hampshire. We heard testimony there in Cannon Mountain that the temperature in New England in the winter has actually warmed up 4.4 degrees Fahrenheit since 1970. We were told by scientists that the weather in Boston now in the winter is the weather that Philadelphia had in 1970. And if this pace of warming increases, that we will continue to go down the eastern seaboard of the United States trying to find a comparable city, um, and that uh, perhaps uh, in the future we will have to rename the White Mountains the mountains formerly called the White Mountains, because there will be no snow. Now, in your case that you brought, Massachusetts versus EPA, could you lay out the danger to Massachusetts which you uh, made to the Supreme Court uh, and why it not only affects Massachusetts but, in, but uh, other states in, in our Well, as you know, it was a huge issue on the standing issue alone as to whether or not Massachusetts had suffered harm or could show harm. Uh, and the principal uh, facts that we pointed to were what I um, indicated earlier about <clears throat> the coastline of Massachusetts, that because of the rise in ocean temperature and the receding uh, coastline, we have actually lost 200 miles of coastline. We anticipate that that will continue if this problem is not abated in a way that creates additional issues, obviously, as General Brown indicated, around storms. Uh, weather disasters, contamination of water supplies. I mean, it is not uh, by accident, I guess, that the two states on the coast uh, will feel these effects as earliest already and probably be damaged the most, uh, but they will affect everybody in this country as those effects continue to mount. And the concerning thing is, and I think, again, uh, for this Supreme Court to recognize that Massachusetts was correct, that the Bush administration was not doing its job, I think, uh, speaks for itself. Their acknowledgment that we had met the standing uh, by the actual danger uh, and the anticipated danger supported by scientific um, uh, documentation uh, indicated, I think, the, uh, the real danger that we face now. But more importantly, if we do not start this process, we can expect it to continue unabated. Uh, and your questions to the EPA about uh, rates of how are we going to uh, bring these uh, greenhouse emission rates down uh, clearly does not indicate a timetable that begins to address in an effective and safe way the issues that we are facing now because of global warming. Now, were you surprised when Administrator Johnson on May 14th in his press conference announced that he was looking to Justice Scalia's dissent in Massachusetts versus EPA as the standard that he was going to use uh, as to how the EPA would proceed? Well, when you lose a case, I know as a lawyer, you often look to the dissent for some comfort, but it is not the law of the land. Um, and it is discouraging uh, to see again the failure to acknowledge, even after all of these years and even after the Supreme Court has spoken, that they uh, don't have a timetable, they don't have a way to proceed in a quick and efficacious way, which it calls into question what they really want to accomplish. I think there's no other conclusion that you can draw, not only before the lawsuit, but after the lawsuit. And, and that's why this hearing today is so important, because they need to be held to standards that will allow them to proceed to protect the environment and allow us to proceed in ways, as General Brown outlined, we've already begun to be uh, effective in controlling these gas house emissions, greenhouse emissions. Now, Attorney General Brown, there is, um, as has been noted, a, a piece of draft legislation that has now been uh, introduced. Um, and we're having, and there's a debate over whether or not language in that draft um, legislation 
would in fact prohibit the EPA administrator, Mr. Johnson, from giving California uh, the ability to be able to regulate uh, CO2 emissions from tailpipes. Um, the proponents of the legislation say that it would not prohibit it. Can, can you give us your reading of that draft legislation and what the implications are for your ability to protect the citizens of your state? Well, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, Chairman Dingell wrote a letter to, to the Attorney Generals and admitted that uh, the draft would eliminate EPA's ability uh, to grant a waiver to California to regulate uh, greenhouse gas emissions from cars. So that's right in his letter. And I believe um, that he also said that uh, EPA couldn't regulate uh, greenhouse gases when it w in res uh, with respect to cars. So the, he wants to put it over in uh, NHTSA. That's where he wants to, to uh, situate it. And that is a very different uh, set of standards because, as you mentioned earlier, it's not dealing with, with health, it's not dealing with emissions, it's dealing with fuel efficiency safety and feasibility and the and uh, the the well-being of the industry so those are totally different standards so I, it's very clear here that the, um, the congress has to deal with the fact are you going to let well we have the it's two it's bush won't do it he won't let his epa do it and there's a movement in congress and all if we just focus on auto emissions it's coming from the auto alliance which has a a, a plan to sabotage any efforts to impose restraints on them. That, that, that's the, you can't sugarcoat it any other way. And um, so there we are. It's going to take, ultimately, it's going to take Congress uh, to clarify and to get a national standard. In the meantime, though, it might be easiest uh, to get a California standard mm -hmm. uh, because the, it looks like EPA is moving in a much more uh, circuitous route. I think they're taking deliberate speed to heart. Uh, and deliberate speed doesn't mean fast. It means decades uh, of, of failure to act. That's what it meant in the civil rights area, and it certainly seems to be the same word that they're invoking, uh, that he's invoking in, in this particular area. Well, let me go back to you, Attorney General uh, Coakley, when it comes to Massachusetts versus EPA. There is similar language uh, in this proposed legislation uh, which uh, could potentially strip the EPA of the authority which was given to it uh, as part of your victory in Massachusetts versus EPA. But those who are propounding the legisl the, this legislation say that is not so. Can you give us your reading of what this legislation would do to the victory Massachusetts won at the Supreme Court? Yeah, no, I agree with General Brown uh, on that matter. And uh, my uh, staff, including Assistant Attorney General Jim Milkey, who, by the way, made the argument uh, before the Supreme Court very <coughs> effectively. Uh, and convince them, particularly on standing issues, that that legislation would strip the EPA effectively uh, of the ability to regulate it. And, and I think that the, the committee has clearly noted, and General Brown has noted, um, that although they may have parallel tracks, NHTSA and EPA have very different hats to wear and mandates, and they may be at odds uh, in trying to promote fuel efficiency standards, for instance, coal to liquids or other issues that do not provide for the concern that we have, which is the protection of the EPA. We believe that they are not inconsistent results and they should go hand in hand, uh, but this is not an administration that seems to feel that way. And their response to saying we don't want agencies with overlapping responsibility is to file this bill that would then take it away from the EPA. That is the completely wrong response. If there is overlapping responsibility, then so be it. Let those agencies work it out or let Congress decide. But don't take it away from the agency that has as its mandate the need to protect the environment. Uh, it is a clear end run around, and I think General Brown is right in terms of what is going on here. Did you agree? Is your reading the same as Attorney General Coakley's, uh, Bru Mr. Brown, that uh, Massachusetts versus um, EPA is vitiate, vitiated in that legislation? To the extent that it covers, it allows, yes. The, uh, I, I want to limit my focus to the automobile area, but that is clearly the goal of that draft legislation is to transfer from the EPA to the Transportation Department uh, the, the responsibility to deal with um, efficiency. And uh, there is no conflict. Uh, 
uh, as the Massachusetts Attorney General just said, the, the EPA is, is regulating emissions of uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, the NHTSA is dealing with um, automobile efficiency. But even there, we have to be honest about it, that we're suing NHTSA. We're, they're in court, too. We were, I was in court two months ago in the Ninth Circuit objecting to their paltry and pathetic one mile, an hour, one mile per gallon uh, increase. And as a matter of fact, our experts are saying it's going to increase fuel consumption because they're privileging uh, cars by weight. So the bigger your car, the less you have to reduce. So they're going in the exact wrong direction, invoking safety uh, in this consumer choice business, but they're not dealing with the fact, and that's why to cut through all the smoke and the fog, I noticed that um, the uh, environmental uh, defense in their testimony yesterday had a very simple number, 434 million metric tons of carbon uh, in 205 came from the U.S. auto sector. Now there it is. How much of the 434, which is based on the whole cycle from beginning to end, are they going to cut? Is it going to be 432 next year? Is it going up? Is it going down? By how much? So the big thing I think you have to watch out is the squid process, where they emit all the, this ink to, to block any kind of uh, assault on their status quo effort. And so I want to just know, 434, when does it go down? That's all we got to know. And then what are the means to get it down? What does it cost? What does it take? And I even said, hey, if the automobile companies need some money because they're so mismanaged, I think you ought to give them a few billion. Because I think it's more important to cut uh, greenhouse gases than it is to, uh, you know, to f fight with these automobile companies. If they need a handout, they should own up to the fact they can't do it without a handout. They can line up like everybody else who is needy and has various uh, issues, and uh, we'll help them. But the main thing is take that 434 million uh, metric tons and get it down as soon as you can in the most intelligent, market-based way that you can. That's what cap and trade is about. And by the way, I just want to mention the other thing, oil dependency, 9 million barrels a day, 9 million barrels a day. On a carbon content basis, 65% uh, is imported. 65% if you take the carbon content of the petroleum that we're using comes from foreign countries. Nine million, that's pretty bad. So how do we get that down? How do we save Americans' cons uh, consumers money? And how do we get that, um, the carbon out of the way? That's simple. If they don't give you a measure, if they don't give you a mechanism to enforce it, <coughs> it is baloney. That's the way, I think it's that simple. And I think the biggest enemy here is complexity and, and obfuscation. And we just gotta get it simple, simple, simple. How many, million, you know, how many grams are you taking out of the atmosphere? If you're not going to talk that language, then it's worthless. In fact, it's worse than worthless because he feels like he's doing something good. He should not sleep at night, the guy who's, who's here. And Congressman Markey, you keyed into why it is so important. Although e Massachusetts versus EPA is technically about motor vehicles, the reason why it's, it has broader implications for that and the reason why it's so important for them to make the determination that CO2 is dangerous, do that endangerment process, is because if that's done, then they can say, well, no, this should be handled by the transportation, by NHTSA. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it really is an issue around environmental protection, not just fuel economy. Uh, and, and we have to make sure we keep our eye on that ball and not let them play a shell game with these issues. I agree. I, I thank uh, both of you. Um, and I would just add this in parenthetically that, and I think it's important for people to know this, that uh, the United States only has 3 percent of the oil reserves in the world. OPEC has 70 percent of the oil reserves in the world. We already uh, import 60 percent of our oil from countries we should not be importing it from. Uh, much of that money is used to then support Al Qaeda and other efforts that we then have to increase our defense budget uh, to protect against. Um, that's our weakness, having only 3 percent of the oil resources. But we are a technological giant. That is our strength. Uh, and if the EPA and if NHTSA would propound the regulations that would unleash this technological revolution, then we would be using our strength against OPEC and uh, to solve this problem of global warming. But until they are willing to recognize the danger that we are under, uh, and the solution, we have big problems. Let me now turn and recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you very much. 
Um, Mr. Chairman, I just uh, I found the hearing today to be very, very useful. I, I deeply appreciate uh, our witnesses joining to sort of book in um, the other side of the equation with uh, what I agree with Mr. Brown was sort of an embarrassing presentation. I really do deeply uh, concerned about uh, EPA as an institution, the hundreds of dedicated men and women that I've met with that work there who have a mission to protect the health, <coughs> to protect the environment. Um, what I would like, I just have one question that I would pose to each of you. Imagine for a moment that we had an administration and an administrator that was focused on complying with the decision and its mandate to protect public health. That has been presumably having smart people looking at this uh, since 2005. Um, I understand California has had experience with uh, waivers granted by EPA dozens of times, dozens of times. I don't think any one of them was ever rejected. Um, if we get back in the mindset that they're going to comply with the law and they're going to protect public health and the environment, how fast could this be accomplished? I wonder if both of you would comment on how fast, how it would be done in an ideal world if their commitment was protecting the environment, complying with the law. I'll take a stab at that, Go General ahead. Brown. I, as I indicated earlier, and, and my folks informed me, um, they should have begun right after uh, Massachusetts e versus EPA the uh, determination of the endangerment process, and from that begin to uh, establish the regulations that they feel are appropriate once they made that finding, whether that takes six months or eight months, I'm not sure, but they could do it at least that quickly, it seems to me, because they've been working on these issues and they have before them. But these and they, and they have the body of all the evidence and research and work that went into the crafting of the California. Exactly. And, and so they have a time, they have the endangerment finding threshold, they have hearings, and then they issue the regulations. But while they're doing that, they also can grant California the waiver so that the processes are proceeding immediately in parallel to allow the states to set the way in which we can proceed and in a way that doesn't interfere, I think, with industry trade um, and work at the federal and state level to start this process, as I said yesterday. Uh, the, the, the very concerning thing is all this talk about the need to deliberate and it's complicated and whatever. It, if they wanted to do it, they could do it ASAP, I believe. Well, California has a goal of 30 percent reduction in auto emission greenhouse gases by 2016, and uh, that process is complete. The regulations are ready to go as soon as EPA gives us the green light. Uh, in terms of overall greenhouse gas reduction, uh, we have a, a goal of 25 percent. That, that has, those regulations have not been finished, and th that will take another year or two to get done. But we are on track, and I don't want to minimize that this is something easy. Uh, I think it is difficult. I think the European countries have had a difficult time. The signature, all the Japan, uh, uh, Germany, France, England, they have all had a, t a tough time. So I think what, what really has to happen is that we get a cooperative spirit to reduce to the maximum degree that's, that's truly feasible. And I don't think we have that commitment. It's really a stall uh, to allow uh, the companies, in this case the auto companies, to make as much money as they can because they are having a tough time. They're losing money. They're cutting jobs. I, I'm very sympathetic with that. So I think we have to get into a – but they've got to fight this. They're, this is for them. They're, they're not going to stop. And that pressure then feeds into your deliberations and into the EPA and into the Bush administration. And, and there's where it is. So uh, I, I think we have to do the best job we can, get a scientific and technological and, and market consensus, and try to go. Right now, it's a blockage. It's obfuscation. You don't want liquid from coal. Uh, that's not going to work. Uh, you don't want uh, uh, paltry cafe standards like uh, NHTSA has adopted for light trucks. I mean, we need a, uh, a top-to-bottom honest discussion about what can be done and then just be practical about it. I'm not saying be unrealistic, uh, 
But I don't think we're even there yet. I think what's, what is now is this stall, uh, right. kind of smoke and mirrors kind of thing, and that prevents doing what we could do, which when we get that clarity, it'll still be hard. And, I, and that's why I think uh, we got to get first to the point, what's the amount that we're emitting, what's a goal that we can reduce, and what are the sector by sector game plans in order to get there? And I'm very concerned that it's going to be a couple of years before we even get to agreeing on what the game plan is. Right now, it looks like well, we're just going to have trench warfare right. for the next couple of years, and that's very unfortunate. Well, I'm uh, confident uh, the work that uh, Mr. Markey is guiding with this committee that uh, we can mark more rapid progress. Uh, the leadership of Speaker Pelosi, I think, is uh, intensely focused on moving us forward. Um, but the work that you are doing, I think, can help provide a framework. And I, I uh, think I understand um, how it can be moved forward. I would hope that we could work with you, your staff, and our staff to be able to have a clear, simple explanation of how this could, dare I use the term, fast-track. Fast-tracked administratively or if something needs to happen legislatively to make sure that uh, you're not in limbo, you're able to move forward, and speaking as one of uh, the residents of uh, one of the states that is part of this coalition with you, uh, we all have a stake in your success. So if you could uh, help us frame that uh, in, with more precision, um, I, I think it would be very helpful for us to be able to uh, uh, support your efforts. We can do that. I, I will um, – we have some very good uh, scientists, technology people, lawyers in California working on these very issues. I, when I go back today, I'm going to do exactly what you're saying. I will give you a blueprint for what you should do, and, and we have the capability to do that. We'll write it up, and we'll, well, we'll get it to you as soon as we can. It'll be thoughtful. It'll be practical. It'll be honest. And then maybe you can share it with our Environmental Protection Administrator. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman. I, I really – thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I really don't have any questions. I, I want to express – well, first of all, I apologize for uh, having to leave. I'm, I'm actually running between two committee hearings uh, right now. Um, no. Yes, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm back here now. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, are, are you interested uh, – General Brown in, uh, in becoming the EPA administrator? <laughs> no, because I, I like my independent role. <clears throat> That's a powerful statement you just made. Uh, I, 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 uh, I appreciate this. I, I hope that, that uh, we can, uh, as, as I heard you saying, uh, take uh, use of your commitment and, and energy in this, in this area. Uh, to, to deal with this growing problem. Uh, as a former mayor, uh, 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 you know that this is the number one issue of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. They set their priorities for this year, and climate change, uh, dealing with this issue on a local level, is their, their priority. They will be dealing with this when they're uh, at a, in their summer meeting in Los Angeles. Uh, and then we will uh, – we've been asked to come to a field hearing later in Seattle. So uh, I, I think there are people all around the country. There is some cause for optimism, uh, not from my perspective listening to what we heard earlier, but certainly from when you, when you look at the mayors, and as you know, the U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, is a bipartisan group, and, and they voted unanimously to, 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 uh, to uh, uh, name climate change as the number one issue. Uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm to some degree optimistic that, uh, that uh, the, the government may not lead the way, but I think the people are far ahead of the government, and, uh, this government, and, and that, we'll that the people are going to push us and push some section of, the, of our government into action. So I thank you both of you for, for coming and apologize for not having been here. Great. Um, well, let's, let's – uh, Let's then sum up. Let, let's let each of the attorneys general who are with us give us their two-minute two summations to the jury here in 
terms of what they believe that uh, Congress should do with uh, the pending legislation before us uh, and what their recommendations. So uh, we began with uh, Attorney General Brown. So let's begin the, the final statements with you, Attorney General Coakley. Well, my summation may not be all that different from what we argued before the Supreme Court in Massachusetts versus EPA, which is this administration has the authority and now the obligation to issue regulations around uh, motor vehicle uh, emissions. And unless they can and will do that immediately, uh, Congress has to take action. Uh, the, the, immediate, the draft discussion pending, uh, we believe, is counterproductive and takes us backwards. So uh, we are not in favor of that bill. And we would suggest further that what's very important for us at the state level is to allow, as California has led the way, to obtain those waivers so we can proceed to do what we are doing and work co collaboratively with uh, Congress and whatever legislation it feels appropriate. And I believe that can be done in a way that gives industry uh, a predictability uh, that can involve them, in fact, in, in a way that lets them feel uh, that they won't be done sector by sector, but that everybody um, has an interest, whether they are uh, in government, uh, they are in private practice, uh, whether they are uh, involved in, in Washington, has an interest in making sure that we address this problem. And it is too serious and it is too important. And it is not speculative. It is a real issue uh, that we need to start to address today. And we look forward to working with you and your staff on this committee and uh, providing what guidance we can. Thank you very much. Attorney General Brown. Um, I believe the most important point is, the, is to recognize the seriousness of climate disruption, that although there is always uncertainty in scientific modeling and evidence, the risk is so catastrophic, there is a risk, rather, of catastrophe, and that risk is not 2 percent or 5 percent. It is a substantial risk. And insurance against that is really what we are asking. And I would say in the tenor of, uh, of this administration's remarks, there seems to be no recognition of the magnitude of the threat that we are facing. And therefore, their response is appropriately tepid for their non-recognition of what it is that we are facing. So that recognition has to be uh, the first thing. Uh, number two, in dealing with global warming, we, uh, of necessity, reduce our dependency on foreign oil. And that is something that every American feels very strongly about, and we have to keep front and center. And then thirdly, I believe protecting the EPA's authority, and that authority, of course, includes the uh, waiver potential for California, and if necessary, to block bad legislation, do no harm, I would say is, has to be the first objective, uh, and then, uh, as circumstances permit, get some positive legislation. But it, it may not be possible in the next 18 months. It may take longer. I mean, if, uh, uh, President Bush thinks it takes 18 months to get his own agencies to come up with a plan. It wouldn't be surprising if it took Congress longer than that, because uh, there is more divergency there. But whatever, uh, I think it is pretty clear uh, what has to happen. The Massachusetts won a great victory. That victory has, has to be protected. Um, it cannot be end run or sabotaged um, without great harm. So I think, I think our goal, the, the, what, what has to be done is, is clear. And the final point I'd make is we need to state this problem in clear numerical measures of carbon and how much carbon are we taking out each year. That's the goal. And that should be able to be spoken in a matter of a few words. And so everybody knows what the goal is. Everybody knows where we are. That's the report card. And I think it's, it speaks volumes that the administrator and the uh, representative of NHTSA did not speak in a measurable report card-like way. Measure us if you see this. So it was a lots of different points. So I think it has to be simplified by metric tons of carbon linked with reducing oil dependency. Th that, to me, is where we have to go and then do as best we can, given the technology and, and the cost that, um, that are entailed. 
we thank uh, both of you for your uh, eloquent testimony, but uh, for your uh, vigorous uh, protection of um, the laws of um, your states uh, and actually of the country, because you're fighting to give the EPA the authority which it needs in order to protect our country. Um, just so we're clear here, Massachusetts versus EPA protects California and the other 48 states. But similarly, the California statute, which you are here to testify to protect Attorney General Brown, has been adopted by Massachusetts uh, and uh, 11 or 12 other states. So this effort coming out of the states uh, is what is now applying the pressure to the Bush administration. But it is also coming from the mayors. Uh, it is coming from the universities. Uh, and it is coming from individuals all across our country. And it is similarly coming from the United Nations and their reports on global warming and the threat uh, to our planet, but to, to the United States and its citizens as well. Uh, Speaker Pelosi, uh, in our trip uh, as a Select Committee on Global Warming 10 days ago, uh, visited Greenland and its ice cap, which is the epicenter of the threat to the planet. We were seven-tenths of a mile high block of ice on this ice cap, with hundreds of miles long and wide. And uh, it was five or six Empire State Buildings high, a block of ice. It is melting, it is moving towards the sea. Uh, if it does that, Ultimately, it would lead to a 20-foot increase uh, in the sea level of the world. Uh, Speaker Pelosi was told by those in Greenland that she was the highest-ranking American public official to ever visit Greenland. What a shame our EPA administrator has yet to visit. Uh, and she has made it quite clear that she is not going to allow for uh, appearance in California law or a law which will give the EPA the ability to be able to act on these issues. Uh, but it is your efforts at the State level that has created now this conflict with the Bush administration. Uh, and Massachusetts and California have been in the lead, and we thank you for that. The two individuals here are the living embodiment of this effort. We thank you for your efforts. Uh, this hearing is adjourned. A live picture of the U.S. Capitol here with the flag at half-staff in honor of the late Senator Craig Thomas. The Wyoming Republican died earlier this week, and his funeral is scheduled for tomorrow. Another